Hello folks, I hope um, your life is trying a dramatically different setting now, which is saying like, let's shoot the breeze, let's have some fun, let's get a conversation going, let's uh, have a chat about this and that. We kept a reasonably open platform, we said, look, let's, everything goes, not restricted anything. Uh, so I'm just trying to see if my, this, I, I seem to be hearing some volume from here, I'm just trying to fix that. Give me a second, we're good to go. to hear any volume yeah lovely good evening to all of you once again i hope uh, we have some fun today discussing about uh, different topics we've always talked about lrdi and vrc and quant i'm not saying i don't like that but probably a good time to expand the scope and have some discussions going and so we're gonna shoot your questions across um we will we will have a what hopefully most of them hopefully all the relevant ones the fun ones uh we have a lovely team here akib and bharat are live with us we are going to be curating the list and deciding which questions we would pop up the rest of it if all the tech is good if you can see me and hear me super clearly and we are, we are good to go if you are uh, eager to go as excited as i am then let's start off and uh, i have a bunch of questions on my on my dashboard here so i'm going to start with that uh, the first one is from shreya sinha reality of jobs in india as a fresher i'm looking for job opportunities but the compensation i'm receiving is peanuts it, has, it seems as if my years of education is worth nothing. Why do recruiters value tags so much? Um, by tags, I mean, I, I think Shreya means talk about IITs and NITs and IIMs. Why do recruiters pay so much of a bomb to, to some institutes, some names? Right? So all education is a signal. Um, the IIT or an IIM or an NIT sends a powerful signal. It says, hey, this person can, can put their head down and execute. Either they are super smart or they are super hardworking and frequently both. And that is a powerful signal. As a recruiter, I can tell you that sometimes I can get tremendous value for a, for a resource that plays, that, for which we pay 2 lakhs per annum. And, and sometimes we get good value for so that we pay 8 lakhs, 9 lakhs per annum. The problem is there's always a management cost that is there. And so if I get, you can easily argue that we get 4 guys at 2 lakhs per annum. One of them will be fantastic, will be as good as the 8 lakh per annum, 10 lakh per annum resource. The other three will be decent. So it is better off to recruit four people at 2 lakhs per annum and, and 8 lakh per annum or 10 lakh per annum. Why should we pay a premium to the, to the time? The thing is the management bandwidth, the management cost increases. So if you can get good resources, the guaranteed good resource at a premium, you'll pick it. And so that's how cricket teams operate, that's how football teams operate, that's how the, your IPL franchise operates. So one killer fast bowler. Is at a 10x, 15x, 30x, 40x premium to four middling medium basis. And so that's that's why the the tags rank so much. And to the most more important question is that um, uh, is my education worth nothing? Definitely not. Most of the education is a signal. You've got to say, hey, my signal right now is this. You should find the best return that the market can give you. That's important. You need to bargain, negotiate, find a good deal, find different jobs, see where you work. But early part of your career, what you earn is, uh, is far less important than how much you learn. So if you're in a beautiful job that gives you a beautiful learning experience, your 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 earning short-term earnings simply don't matter. And your, your trajectory is going to determine what you earn through a lifetime. Most people will tell you that their salary on year one to year ten to year twenty, generally the the, the swing is one to ten to forty. So if you're on a good trajectory, it can go from 1, 10, 40. If you're on a poor trajectory, it can go 1, 3, 7. If the, whether it is 1, 10, 40 or 1, 3, 7 is a function of how much you learn in your first four, five years, how fungible your skill sets are. So if you can find yourself a good place, which is a learning environment where you can, where things get thrown at you, where you get responsibility for yourself. The first two, three years earning less than market or what you can get simply doesn't matter. If you can add relevant skill sets to yourself, you will go places. So don't worry too much about your earning capacity in your first few years. Definitely, it doesn't matter. It's not relevant. It's not material for your prospects over a over a, over a lifetime, over a long career. So don't fixate on your first pay packet, on your pay packet for the first few years. It definitely does not mean that your years of education are for nothing. Your years of education give you the power to hang in there and the ability to learn new things quickly. And make a telling impact three years, five years, seven years down the line. Next question is from Siddhan Rawat. What's your reaction? People calling you the James James Bond. 
question. Say it's some, uh, it's one of those random fun things. There's not much to react about that. I think Bharat is having a little bit of fun throwing this question into the mix. Uh, it is some one person coining and having some fun. A bit of a joke, nothing more than that. I'm going to move to the next question. It's from Vivek Singh. How will you feel if, uh, if the IAMs choose to prepare, choose you to prepare the CAT 2022 question papers? Will you change the existing pattern or follow the passion? Oh, brilliant, brilliant. I love this question. Uh, first of all, I'll feel thrilled. I'll feel honored. I'll feel um, delighted. Say, look, this is my chance to make sure that everybody is chosen the right way. Uh, I'll stick to what they are testing. They're testing broadly quantitative ability, broadly verbal ability, broadly logical reasoning. I like, I like all three. And then don't, don't get me wrong. I think these are the relevant things to test given the trade-off between the time and constraints. So I've heard so many people say, do I need to be really great at math in order to be a good manager? Of course not. Of course not. But being good at math and good at verbal, figuring out new puzzle-like settings guarantees a certain intellectual ability. I cannot evaluate emotional quotient and man management ability in a three-hour setting. And I have two lakh applicants. So I need one filter. So that filter has to work brilliantly. And the framework they have chosen for the filter, I like that. What I will not do, I will not have this two-hour exam. I'll put a lot of fight to have a three-hour exam. I'll even try to see if I can do it a 90-minute, 90-minute, two sections because you need some time to, to recover from some mistake. Then what I'll do is I'll dial down the level of difficulty of this logical reasoning section and make it such a big hit or miss that you get one idea right and then you fly. You get a couple of things wrong and you end up with three marks or five marks. So I think become, they've erred on the side of excess. They, 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 took down, they, they took the level of difficulty in one direction. But I think they have overshot the sweet spot that I'll change. I'll change the, the verbal ability section. I find every now and then the question qualities to become too much on the ambivalent territory where it is vague and, and, and subjective and not really striking a chord. I'll amp up the quality in the verbal section. Quant, I find a bunch of things which are, um, which are not, uh, not fundamental enough, not interesting enough, not intuition testing enough. So I'll change the type of questioning, not the pattern, not the uh, subjects covered, not the uh, nature of the exam, not multiple choice data, none of that. I'll make it a three-hour exam, but I'll, I'll create questions. We do it extensively, both in 2IM and especially for Fiber, where we say, hey, you know the funda. You can answer this really quickly if you get the funda, the crux of it. Otherwise, you're in trouble. I'll make sure there are tons of questions like that, rather than run of the mill, just plug in formula, plug in substitute, sub solve something and get it. So each question will be juicily set so that it, it tests the clear understanding of one idea. And it's only 30 questions, not rocket science. We can put it, pull it off. So I will change the quality and type of questions in quant, uh, weed off some of these really cranky ones in verbal, lower the level of difficulty in the puzzle section. But otherwise, these are three things I'm testing, same format, objective, mostly multiple choice. I like all that. But I like the 3R format more than the 2R format. Broadly within that, but cleaned up a little bit. I'll be thrilled to bits that somebody asked me to do this. Next one is from um, Srini Ket. It kind of takes off from here, I think. Should CAT be conducted twice a year considering the pandemic? Uh, I don't propose a best of two like SNAP. But shouldn't there be two slots out of which you can pick one considering the uncertainties that the pandemic brings in? So, so. Uh, I'm firmly, firmly for it. I forget the pandemic. I think we have definitely come to the point where the CAT itself should be conducted at least twice a year. And I'll give you my, my reasons. One is there's too much riding on a 2R exam. The emotional investment over an 8 month, 10 month, 11 month cycle is too high. The IAMs and several colleges have gone to their admission paradigms saying, look, we'll take care of your, think about your 10th, we'll think about your 12th, we'll think about your UG, we'll think about your work experience, your profile, we'll give more weightage to how you conduct yourself in the interviews. We care about all this, the, the package, and not just a thing in your 2R, 3R thing. But this is a good direction to go in, and which is nice. So they are, they are saying, I'm not going to make it dependent on a 3R exam. But then on top of this, the 3R exam is like a gatekeeper. The 3R exam doesn't guarantee you anything, but it can kick you out of this process. So the, the emotional investment, I need to prepare for seven, eight months. I need to put a bunch of things on hold. I need to commit myself to learning obscure formula, tricky ideas, puzzles. Uh, I need to have fierce discipline doing this. And I, don't get me wrong, I like the idea of preparing for something. I'm a teacher. So I like the idea that the exam is challenging, interesting, and it, it, it makes you learn new things, which is even otherwise a good trait. But uh, the, the 
the, the stress and emotional investment for an uncertain journey uh, that is sometimes uh, too high i see year after year every every 10 successful candidates that i see and i come across and i my heart goes you know, I, it jumps up saying um, our students are doing well any student is doing well i i meet 40 or 50 uh, with with shoulders drooped and heads dropped where they feel the weight of uh, having misfired in a 120 minute exam they feel the burden of having let themselves down and frequently they feel the burden of having let somebody else down and some rare occasions on, on letting me down it is uh, it is very unfair that the equation is phrased in such 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 a way where we feel that it's a it is an indicator of what I am capable of, what anyone is capable of, and I find that emotional burden to be sometimes uh, unnecessarily crippling. We all carry emotional burdens, and when you are sitting outside the hospital for when your child is being born, that is a stress that you can't you can't say okay, dial this down. But uh, an MBA exam, especially one where you have dialed down the importance of this exam by saying all other parameters are important, all other ones are crucial as well. And having it twice a year or three times a year, brilliant. So I'm, there's not one shot at it. I'm going to prepare for this exam. I'm going to give this in, in November. Hey, it didn't exactly go as planned. I'm going to give this in March. Not happy. I'm going to give this in August. I get three shots at it. I can prepare in a four-month sprint. I know I have everything in place. I can, I just, it just didn't work that day. Something was wrong. I was not well. I'm going to give one more shot at it. That could be very uh, energizing. It could, it could keep the entire framework of what they are testing, how they are testing the the percentiles, the admission barrier, the, uh, uh, the differentiating between good and great and average and good, everything the same, but reduce the, the emotional pressure, the stress of going through this grind. I think it would be brilliant if they, if they did that. It is about time they did that because the, it is an unnecessary burden for students to carry. I'm firmly behind this idea of having cat at least twice a year. If it were up to me, I would say it at least three times a year. And not not pandemic linked per se three times a year. Wonderful. I'm going to go to the next question. This again is from uh, Shani Ket. Cab companies like Ola Uber charges a cancellation fee when we cancel the cabs after a certain amount of time, which is fair because I waste their time. But many times cabs make us wait for it to seven minutes and then they cancel our booking. And shouldn't they pay us when, when considering they've wasted our time? Doesn't it work both ways? Right? So, uh, I, I'm firmly with you on this, Trinikit. I've got, I've, some these days I've, I've completely said, look, I'm not touching Ola or Uber. Because for me, one is a comfort. And so, for, look, I'm not driving, somebody else is driving me. Two, is the necessary factor is the reliability. I'm willing to pay a premium for good comfort. But good comfort without reliability is too stressful. I don't want to book, uh, open an app and click on a cab without being ultra sure that it will come in five minutes or seven minutes. Then I can't plan to go to a railway station or an airport. Then I have to do the, 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 the 1980s thing saying, look, I have a train at 10. I need to be there by 9.30. I should leave at 8.45, but I don't know when the cab will come. Let me book at 8.15. On that day, that guy will come at 8.13. You're sitting in the railway station for one hour, 10 minutes. And you'll feel like, look, I could have taken my own cab, my own car, or I could have taken an auto or, or many of many other options available. And so this is a super crucial point and I don't think it's a point that is even worth just a compensation payment and so I, if I say they say look if I cancel I'll give you 40 bucks that's not good enough for me if I cancel and they take 40 bucks that's all right but the, the cab driver or the system cannot have the liberty of cancelling at short notice and they're just paying back with money because then that again is a problem structurally I think this is a, this is a very important feature of our lives that, that there are initially there were service providers and consumers and then for all of these, there's, there's a middle player who's come in, who's originally claimed to be a phenomenal market maker. So cabs, Ola and Uber played a role. A bunch of drivers with cars, a bunch of people who want transport service, let's match, match them. Before that, the big daddy was Amazon. Providers of goods and services, goods predominantly, consumers, let's create a market for them. Then it is Zomato, Swiggy, Airbnb, all of them. They are, they are saying, look, we're market makers. Uh, and they claim to disintermediate, saying, look, that's not, they don't need a supply chain. I'll be the one person, and then you can order through me. It's a proposition that Amazon and Flipkart offered. Instead of disintermediating, they've also become an intermediary, which is inevitable. And so, but the problem now is the intermediary holds an enormous power because they have the ability to aggregate consumers. They have the ability to aggregate providers. So anytime the guy who's aggregating has a bargaining power. And so, 
Originally, these guys paid a lot of subsidies to both sides, to the providers and to the consumers, in order to create the market. Their route to profitability in whatever format is by enjoying some aggregator advantages and saying, look, I am the giant here. You want a route to that service provider, I, you have to go through me. And because I am present here, I have the ability to, to, to control pricing. And that's a, this is a bargaining part, plain and simple. So my solution, or which I think uh, is, is, uh, which I'm firmly holding on to, is every place, every marketplace that has been created, I bend over backwards to try to patronize the original provider. So if I, if I like ordering through Swiggy, I like going to my regular restaurants. The three or four that I like, I go there. I speak to the waiters, I converse with them. I know that guy who serves coffee. Uh, there is uh, Ola Uber, I've stopped patronizing them. I have my own vehicle or I take the metro or if worse comes to worse, I'll pick up a couple of auto rickshaw walas nearby. So I think we need to disempower the intermediary as, a, as individuals and as communities because these guys are out there. They're going to squeeze both ends and the, for their economics to work, they need their pricing power to be higher. They're initially, there's magic because they expanded the market. Now it is only, uh, the market is that much. If, if they don't squeeze the consumer and the provider, they can't be profitable. And sooner or later, unit economic profitability is going to play a role. And these buggers, for all the genius they bring in, they have gigantic overheads. I think Ola, Uber and all that, they spend so much on app and tech and paying CEO salaries and whatnot, that sooner or later, the overhead will play a role. It's incredibly tough to run a successful restaurant business. So the restaurant guys who actually crack and go through, and then they have to give 30% to Swiggy, they're going to get squeezed. They'll cut corners. They will cut corners. So the experience through Swiggy will become an issue. And what is the market response that I'm hoping for MAD that will happen, should happen, is for us to find our restaurants, find, for us to find delivery mechanism for our restaurant. And call up that guy and tell, I'll come and pick it up, but uh, get the order ready. So the convenience angle of the, of the, uh, of the not waiting there at the restaurant is there, is built in. But we don't pay 30%. We don't have an intermediary. We don't have the packaging cost. We don't have the environmental footprint, all of that. So we as consumers will have to push the boundaries and get back our bargaining power. I am a firm believer that even if our environmental consciousness or our disempowering of corporates, those abilities are not there, our price sensitivity alone will play a huge role. I'm super convinced that the Indian consumer is the person who will fight back against these intermediaries because our Indian intermediaries do a several Indian jugads and they are really tough business places to be in. So there was a there's a flower delivery app these guys built. It said you can click and order flowers. I was like, nice. And then they give free for the entire building for, for two days, 40 bucks worth flowers for each person, which is all nice. But if I it's incredibly tough and wafer thin margins of, of of selecting flowers and delivering to people. There's a network of ladies who, who do that and go door to door or you go to a place and buy them. We need to double down and build our super local relationships and make sure that the unit economics of these behemoths never work. And this works across categories. And I think the final, the, the, their playbook is very clear. Subsidize both ends, create a marketplace. Kill all the other providers, go to a monopoly or duopoly. Use pricing power, squeeze both ends. Make unit economics work and then expand. I think the first three, four steps they've done, the final unit economics working everywhere in the world is working beautifully because once they create a duopoly, they, are, they have created habits of going through the what food delivery guy, going through the taxi delivery guy. Indian habits are when it comes to price sensitivity. I'm on millionaires, or reasonably well off Indians who will not who will balk at 1.3x pricing or 40 rupees for Swiggy delivery. It's not there, not there in our DNA to give 50 rupees, 70 rupees for the trade. In some cases, it's worthwhile, but if you don't push back, we're in trouble. So I'm a gigantic fan of pushing back against all of our uh, new age, new fangled intermediary services. They brought in a mechanism of redefining the market, uh, but now they're just squeezing everybody else. This is more, more feudal, the new age disruptive technology and all that. So they they know they they get to their route. Their planning is to get to a monopoly and then squeeze both ends. And I'm not such a big fan of that. Sorry, became a rant. Uh, went on for too long. Let's go to the next question. This is from um, Sarathi Day. 
what is your immediate reaction after knowing that you had converted the uh, uh, IMB way back in the, in the past? Obviously, I was thrilled, thrilled to bits. I was very happy. Uh, it was one of the my preferred colleges. I, I hadn't gotten into IMA. I, I always had a soft corner for uh, Bangalore, the city. I got into Bangalore and Calcutta. So we, my, my, a couple of my friends and I, we discussed where to go. Uh, I, I've always been fascinated by the city Bangalore. Bangalore and Mumbai were my my, my the cities to to, to go to. Uh, it was it was a very comfortable thrill feeling. But truth be told, uh, I was kind of confident. I knew that I was going to go into get an admit into two out of the three of ABC. I was reasonably clear that I had my good chances. Uh, in the, back then, seventy percent, eighty percent was based on your CAT score. And I had done reasonably well in a couple of the interviews. And I, I, I studied in, in IIT. So I had several things going for me. And I knew my CAT score would have been there in the mix. When I got through uh, engineering for, for IIT, that was a big, big, big thrill. I was 17. I didn't know what I was about. I had no confidence in my abilities. Um, I, I, I was not sure about how where this exam would fall. I didn't know what engineering meant. I, I was just a guy who's written, written an exam and was waiting for himself. So... That was a huge thrill. This one was quite content and happy, but it was not out of the blue. And, and it was not uh, a dramatic game changer. Hmm. Go to the next one. This is from uh, Kamlakar. When you left the job to lead to IM, didn't you have anyone who opposed that? <laughs> uh, yeah, there are quite a few. Quite a few. Quite a few naysayers. Quite a few who were super surprised. Quite a few who were uh, who just didn't understand what might be the motivation to... Uh, to quit a what, what was a definitely a cushy job, a severely overpaying job, to do something in a without a clear definition of what it was going to be about. Um, so I did face quite a few kind of raised eyebrows, no doubt about it. Uh, my parents didn't get it. Uh, several of my uh, family and extended uh, family and, and friends didn't get it. It was not a decision that was uh, well thought out. It was not. Uh, if anyone wants to be entrepreneurial, my story is kind of an example of how you should not go about it. So one fine day, I packed my bag inside and came and said, look, I'm going to do something. And I got a job and I was scouting out. I said, look, I like teaching. Why don't I do this? And why did we, uh, my vision in teaching was to kind of change the way math was being taught from across age groups, from as young as possible to largest uh, age group that I could address, to, to break the way some patterns of math teaching had been built. So that's my my, my big, big team. Uh, but it took me years to even go down that route after I entered the education sector. So I, I cut my teeth in taking tons of classes for cross exams. Uh, and that really helped in, in understanding the subject and the pedagogy and the idea of breaking down teaching and all of that. Uh, but it, I did not start with a business plan. I did not start with a clear idea. I did not start with a yay or yes or no decision making flow chart. I just went all in uh, with nothing more than a or nothing more than a whim. I definitely did not have my family prepared. Uh, lucky enough for me, my my wife didn't have any issues at all. She's been a saint throughout the process. So it was the first few years were uh, cruel in terms of the the, the journey we we're taking. It was a gigantic uh, lifestyle change, and it. There was a couple of points where it looked like it had all been for no good reason. So I must confess that it is not definitely one, one, uh, one smooth sailing route. Uh, by and large, she's the one who really had a stake in this throughout. Everybody else can have an opinion, but the real stake is only for your uh, life partner. Uh, and she's been, been a saint about this. So I'm lucky that way. But there are severe number of heavily raised eyebrows. So that was definitely there. Chole <laughs> Bature, uh, any advice for relationships in life? Uh, um, I have plenty of them, no doubt about it. Uh, one of my, I won't say regrets, I think one of my things about uh, growing up in Indian setting is that you don't have enough of uh, relationships beyond friendships um, in your growing up phases. You should have lots of them. It is totally worthwhile going through a breakup or two. It defines what you want to know. It defines about something about yourself, about how you feel about someone else, about uh, how you can navigate relationships. Several of 
first are not equipped to handle a relationship because it's very often the first or second one you're getting into. Everything takes practice, so to do relationships. We take holds too much store on it being a lifetime thing. Uh, and I think women are more guilty of this than men. We don't jump in and just say, look, let's see where it goes. Uh, I think generationally that's changing dramatically. So when, in, when I was growing up, it was not the norm. Now it is more of the norm to, to, to have relationships uh, which are non-platonic, but which are not decisive. There was no such thing, no such, hey, we have a relationship, let's see where it goes at all. In, 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 or it was just beginning to start. But now I think that's going to become the norm. So definitely, definitely uh, test the crowd. So if, if, if there is someone who you think is special, you must take the risk and go for it. Uh, it may or may not work out. The price of it not working out is not that high. Yeah. Never thought I'll be talking about relationships on a, on a live show. Hey, anything goes. I'm one of the least equipped people to talk about this, right? So it goes on to say that you have a camera in front and some people are willing to listen, people will talk all kinds of trash. And, uh, your portfolio of stocks. This is from Sanjeev. My portfolio of stocks from the time uh, 2003, I graduated from, from my MBA. So I had uh, any money to invest in 2003 till 2022 has been zilch. I'm not, I'm not dabbled in stocks. I was in the equities market. I was a stock analyst for a while. I had to give buy, sell rating, I had to analyze stocks. I can do fundamental analysis. I can have a poke at uh, market risk study. I understand at least I used to do beta, gamma, all kinds of things. I was, I'm a happy quant guy, uh, but my career was in fundamental analysis. So just look at a company. I can look at uh, read balance sheets, PNL, cash flow. I've done discounted cash flow models. I've said this has to be shorted. That has to be, you have to go long this pair, that. Whatever, the, 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 the whole stock evaluation thing I've done. Several company sizes I've done, some one or two IPO analysis and all of that. But I've never invested. Uh, I've surprised myself at how agnostic I've been to the idea of stock prices going up and down. I would, I had, I would have a portfolio of stocks to look at or large caps in big European markets. Uh, but I've gone three, four days without looking at share prices. I, I don't get the thrill of a buy and a sell and a trade and an intraday movement and what's happening because of an interest rate cut, what's happening in will a Russia, Ukraine war really materially impact share prices, should I short this, long this, what's going to happen to oil prices. The academic interest appealed to me, the, the thrill of the trade didn't appeal to me, so, uh, so which is probably one of the reasons why it was very easy for me to exit the industry. The, the one thing that I missed uh, really heavily from the industry was money. Nothing else uh, was, even, was even a factor. The, the, the so-called intellectual kick, man, there's nothing so intellectual about financial sector. At least not 10% as much as the guys in the financial sector like to pretend there is there's nothing. Uh, the quantitative thing is just bakwas. There's probably 1% of finance jobs that are truly quantitative in nature and they're not half as quantitative as they are made out to be. And so it's just a, the thrill of large amounts of money trading hands and being in the news and being a newsmaker, there's no in, nothing intellectually challenging. There's a trade kick that several people get, which is why the, the idea of trading is addictive, like, like betting on horses or, or anything or lottery. So that element of uncertainty and grappling with it and playing with it is very appealing for some people. I didn't have that. Intellectual challenge was nil to not very high. Money was good. Uh, it's from Rohan. What is your opinion on SPJ IMR versus IAM's LKI? Uh, I like IM Lucknow, but I think SPJ IMR would store would, would probably be uh, not above INK. So it will be Lucknow, SPJ IMR, IK, but I'm not the best person to answer this. Probably uh, clearly territory with uh, Bharat or Subhash. They understand the rankings of colleges way better than I do. Uh, wherever you are, derive value, make sure you do well academically, hang in there. That I'm for. <laughs> but uh, ranking of colleges, I'm not your guy. But if I had to throw it out, Lucknow, SPJ IMR, then IK. I, I've not been a big fan of how INK have built their legacy advantage over time. They were, they were number five and number six just when the MBA thing was exploding. And I think they've tried too many things too quickly, not stood for anything, not built an academic uh, track record as well as they could have. Everything was handed to them on a platter and they've thrown it away a little bit. See, that's my opinion. Next one, um, this is Riyash Sharma, how to be consistent and manage cat prep along with the grant. I'm going to stay away from quite a few of the cat prep questions. Right? We've done plenty of those. So we'll take this, uh, find some balance, find some routine, find 
tell yourself that this is your ticket to the other career that you have dreamt of whatever your motivation is to do an mba this is your ticket to that so it could be fear is a good motivator hope is a good motivator so this this is a hope for that or the fear that you'll be stuck doing something else either way that can be a driver for you uh, but the discipline is super important motivation is for the high the discipline is what will sit at the base uh, mr adu talks about the ipl auction tomorrow sir recently i told somebody i was too old for instagram i'm definitely too old for ipl auction and i don't have time for uh, the auction system i like to watch the odd match I, i'm a big fan of sport i watch a lot of sport uh, even today i've watched a lot of sport when i was growing up in my classes in school in colleges immediately after college i would watch tons of sport and uh, there was a time where i would act, i actively followed football and cricket i still do and i watch almost all sports or most all is in stretch but a lot of sports and so i am a sports buff i like watching sports and thinking about sports and all that but in cricket matches i followed the ashes but i don't have i don't even i don't i'm not following india versus west indies the one day series so the india south africa test series was gripping i like that so i'm, I'm, I'm still a fan of test cricket i really like that uh, and i have time for odi i do watch t20 but i don't have the bandwidth to get excited about uh, ipl auction the, the this guy went for that price gives me no thrill maybe it's just the same extrapolation of the financial industry this is priced at this much it will go up it will come down and that doesn't hold a thrill for me best memory at i am bangalore um, i don't think i have one uh, vivid memory to, to recall i had a blast i had a blast i had a blast at time bangalore i was the uh, in iit madras i had my i, I was put in place the bunch of guys who were uh, phenomenal they were really good at things that i was not good at and they were really really good at things which i thought i was good at they were better than me at things that i sucked in they were better than me at things that i thought i was good in so it was a super humbling experience i thought i was a math kid in my class of 80 there were 10 guys who were better than i was i i didn't get drawing in my class of 80 75 were better than me. that was so it was a humbling experience in the extreme and sometimes stressful and i am bangalore was in comparison was a breeze i got accounting and i, I fell in love with economics so i was the engineer who was happiest doing accounts and economics in my first semester one of my chartered accountant or my bcom friends classmates were teaching me accounting but then i was the third semester i was discussing valuation with them i was telling them look we could do this we could do that a very happy atheist with, with with anything that has some numbers in it people think is quant heavy but the quant in finance in in, in mba is minuscule compared to what you face in in in, in hardcore electrical engineering stuff so I, I, it was a breeze so i had a blast I had a complete blast no one moment really stands out um, i had lots of late night discussions with friends over uh, over no good point i had a time i remember going to night canteen at 1 am and, and just just whiling away the time till 3 uh, uh, being in some random party from 12 to 4 playing chapak tak road middle of the night so i did a lot of these uh, goofing off things so i was had a blast in those two years but i don't have one stand out thing that i can place next one from saikiran uh, do we have a chance to choose area before going to placements in iims or will they uh, do so by coincidence uh, most of the times you can pick electives and courses but i don't think you there i am don't have the notion of a formal specialization so if you're doing finance you do two more courses in finance if you're doing marketing you do three more courses in marketing but that's about it you you say you've done more courses in it answer questions show your affinity in the interview you're good to go next one i'm going to once lokesh has asked thoughts on philosophical idea and nihilism the belief in nothing how it's out there right i had to read upon this i had to read upon nihilism because i need to i want to know the exact definition and so i just wanted to know your perspective uh, nihilist is the guy who says look everything is uh, a couple of steps beyond cynicism and so he's the guy who's out to burn everything and who's, who's existence is filled with uh, not angst but a feeling of hey, everything is screwed anyway uh, the 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 best nihilist is the joker from batman So he, he, he's like, look, I'm out to some. There's this that famous meme. 
some guys just like to watch the burn, world burn. That's a nihilist. And so, I'm not a fan. <laughs> it's extremely funny. It's, it's a, uh, the nihilist thing is, uh, there's a certain romance to seeing a character vividly etched on, on the basis of nihilism, on, on, on angst, on saying, look, let's throw the fire into, throw everything into fire, throw, just burn everything down. There's a certain thrill to it, raw thing to do it. I'm not a nihilist by any stretch of imagination. I'm an Indian entrepreneur. So Indian entrepreneurs are frequently given to rants and they sound cynical. But there's one of those essential ingredients you need to if you're an Indian entrepreneur and that is boundless optimism. And so we always live for the next cycle. We find a way to pick ourselves up and find something new to do, find something, carve out our space, put fight to define our product. Uh, make something better compared to last season. Make something new, compelling that can last a decade. And we're always about that. It could be a, a market tweak. It could be a way you present yourself. It could be an idea. It could be an ad. It could be a, a new consumer proposition. But it, we're always about reinventing and pushing and prodding and jugad or creativity. But it's, it's about the next cycle. Uh, without that uh, delusional optimism, you can't survive as an Indian entrepreneur. Maybe you can if you're funded. That's a separate story. And so, the, 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 and if you want to be delusionally optimistic or live for the next cycle, you can't be nihilistic. And the cynicism sometimes considered cool. I'm not even a cynic. Sometimes I'm given to rants. It's almost as if I want to rat, get out of the system, sleep, and then come back with a bunch of new ideas. So I think even guys in my office know that if I'm super pissed with something, then I'll pick myself up and I'll come with a bunch of ideas 24 hours later and say, look, let's attack this. There's no problem that that I want to feel like, look, it's all done. I might feel like it's all done at 6 p.m. And at 8 a.m., I'll be like, look, it was, it's all, let it all be done, but let's put, still put fight, let's try these three things, and let's go down in a blaze. And then we'll go and attack that. The idea of saying we'll go down in a blaze is to say, look, let's hit it, let's do something about it. So the nihilist is not someone who's clinging on to the possibility and hope. So, so I'm not a nihilist. Mm -hmm. uh, Lokesh, one more question. Book on the Indian... Renaissance by Sanjeev Sanyal. I must confess straight away that I haven't read it. The author strongly argues that Nehru Malanobi's economic policies after independence made India's economic stature even worse in the global standards. He gives equal importance to liberalization of economic policies in 92 as much as 47. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of, of the 91-92 reforms. I think we give enormous credit to Mr. Manmohan Singh for that. I'm incredibly thankful for that. And I think someone who deserves even more credit and is sometimes airbrushed in our history is uh, Mr. P. V. Narasimhaal. The liberalization was one foot. The tri reforms were another. Both played a role. Liberalization was conceived of by Manmohan Singh. We were pushed through brick by brick uh, by Mr. Narasimhaal. And throughout, we must keep in mind, there's a five-year reign when he was not just supremo and did not have the party completely behind him. And he was running what was on paper a minority government. He never had the votes to stay there. At any time, they were there because the, the, the sitting MPs were more afraid of another election than afraid of than, and, than enjoying the thrill of pulling down this government. They pulled a phenomenal set of reforms, liberalized the economy, removed us from license rights, took us to the next wave across different sectors under extraordinary political constraints. A minority government, they did not have collectively as a coalition 272 or whatever the magic number is. So they ran through that and they did it brilliantly. I'm a gigantic fan of what they pulled off in 91-92. But coming to the 1947 point, I think sometimes we make a mistake of judging events in the past based on the settings of the future. And so the, the Cold War established and has created a full mechanism that, that capitalism is a superior way of running an economy compared to the, 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 the government economy or the socialistic communist model and things were not so clear in 1947. Nehru had a problem in pulling together the country and nobody had capital. Our private sector capital was super limited. The Indian private sector industry lobby went all out to tell Nehru to make the government lead the charge on economic policy, on economic activity. So the government had to play a role on several things because Heavy industry needed heavy investment. Nobody had it. They didn't have the money. They wanted government to lead the charge and the industry wanted to follow. So the decisions Nehru took in saying government to play a very active role in not just regulation, but in running the economy 
was heavily encouraged by Indian industry. And it was in his belief that slowly Indian industry would, would, would cut their teeth and get better. But the government had to lead from the front. But I'm not, uh, I don't want to judge the role played by uh, the government and the, and, the ma and the model that Nehru went on. And our growth rate in the first 15, 18 years, actually pretty good for a country that has just come out of, uh, come out and become free, independent, would fought a war, would fought another crippling war in, in, soon enough, had uh, trouble uniting people, had to consolidate a bunch of kingdoms. In that context, our economic performance was, was, was not bad. And unless Nehru had been super cruel and given the country away to capitalist, uh, we could not have done much better. I think India really lost away in the, in the, the middle 25 years. 1965 to 1990, that was a cruel part for us. So, post Nehru, pre-liberalization. That's where we really, really, really lost our way. When, when, we, when Mrs. Gandhi doubled down on her own mythologies, when she became, uh, when she didn't have the nuance to run an economy, when everything became about controlling the, the the centers of economic activity, when, when we knew we were doing wrong things but didn't have the political courage to pull them back, when there was no credible opposition, when when everything was erratic and, and, and random. So that is a that is the phase where we really lost our way. So I, do, I wouldn't blame Nehru and his decisions on the economy as much as the middle 25 years. 1947 to 65, 67, smooth sailing. 92 onwards, kind of okay. I, I won't say it is smooth sailing from 92. 92 to 96, brilliant. 96 to 98, the wilderness years, politically. 98 to 2003, good. 2004 to 9, decent. 9 to 14, nightmare. 14 to now, mixed. I'm going to go to the next question. This is from Kush. What do you think about the education system of India? What would you be the suggestion to improve it so the deserving one gets rather than not just one with marks? I'm a gigantic fan of saying the deserving one of the one with marks. So I must straight away disagree with that. Uh, we're just talking about Nehru. Uh, the biggest sin or mistake or blunder or by Nehru, I would say, is lack of investment in primary education. Nehru had this temples of modern India, great centers of learning. He invested in the IITs. He said, look, we need to have centers of higher learning for people to aspire to. But India's investment into primary education is, as a percentage of our GDP is one of the lowest in the history of the world. And it's been low till date, but Nehru really set the tone. He never doubled down on creating an opportunity to, to create a setting where our primary education would be fiercely liberating. I think we, we kept on find, trying to find solutions for creating equality, creating an egalitarian system, creating a, a setting where our caste divisions would would go down, all of that. Nehru tried. Nehru did try. But the greatest empowering tool would have been fantastic primary education. Cuba does a fantastic job. Cuba is known as a short country. But if you look at the Cuban education system, it's phenomenal. Everything is free. Everybody is given the same treatment. They spend 10 to 12 hours in school. Their food, clothing, everything is subsidized by the government. They're a really poor country with a phenomenal primary education system. Which is why Cuban doctors are... are they, they travel. Cuban doctors is, is a currency. You can be a Cuban doctor and you'll be welcome. And they, they, they're frequently imported into Venezuela. They get whenever Venezuela runs into trouble. Unfortunately, the economy got constricted. Otherwise, Cuba could have gone places. But our, our primary, real fundamental primary education expenditure had been abysmally low. If I had to put one thing, and say, I'll take all my money and put into early education. I'll take 85% of my budget and say all children from the age of two and a half to 12. The, the state takes that over, bends over backwards, creates fantastic places of learning and get their grounding in place till they are in class six or seven. After that, they are on their own. If you have a good kid with good aspiration, uh, good fundamentals, strong things, you create a labor force that you can bank on for the next six decades. The, the time from two to 12, ages of two to 12, that's a fundamental. 12 to 18 is the next phase. I would not even worry about 12 to 18. I would double down, triple down on 2 to 12. And I'll say, look, I'll create a fantastic system, keep it ridiculously low price, uh, have fundamentally brilliant governing mechanism, get private sector money in through the troughs. I would hawk whatever I need to hawk, but get enormous amount of money into the 2 to 12 segment and, 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 and make that work. 
that will be my my prescription for education system for anywhere if for fear ever in a western economy i'll say do it from 2 to 18 to 21 but india will have pro- india has a poor india has a poor country so we don't have that much money therefore i'll double down where i can get better returns in the near term that will be 2 to 12 which movie it is is again from kush which movie it is if i ask you to watch at least once every week you will watch it <laughs> at least once every week is pushing it uh, see someone asked me to watch the imitation game i can watch it any day any time watch it more than 22 times and still haven't got bored one of my all time favorite movies is uh, uh, several quite a few 3 idiots is something that i can watch and it really strikes a chord with me it's uh, it's insightful meaningful it, it, it is um, cheeky a uh, brilliantly constructed full of our heartwarming moments uh, ridiculously funny it ticks several boxes for me so i really like that i can watch it plenty of time in tamil i can watch michael malakamara any number of times it's a brilliant brilliant movie i can watch that so those are my my go to movies do you cook i'm i'm a good um, assistant <laughs> cook i can cook i can get by but uh, minimally um, i i can I am let me put it this way I can help around in the kitchen way better than I can cook. I'm, I have good skills in all the surrounding activities and limited skills and limited uh, flair in the really key thing. Is it good to invest in crypto? I am in the faintest idea. Crypto scares the bejesus out of me. I have no idea about what crypto I've read I mean I've gone through Suhas's uh, blockchain and uh, crypto and NFT videos I've seen them and they're is well made i've read but i don't understand i don't intuitively get blockchain i simply don't get crypto every time i look at crypto i i i fret i feel like this is a this is a romantic in people striking against the tdm of government agencies and saying look we will strike a blow and we'll have an independently verifiable mechanism to have a storage of wealth and for trading all brilliant but i think government mechanisms for regulating currency are there for a compelling reason and i don't see the advantages of crypto outweighing the risks i'm so i'm paranoid i don't get it and therefore i don't invest in crypto i think crypto is trade crypto is on momentum crypto is on hey very few people understand fundamental value in crypto if at all there is so all of everybody seems to be in this on the basis of greater fool theory we'll buy now it will go up when it goes up i'll dunk it out that's the motto behind crypto so i, I don't I, i don't invest in stocks where am i going to invest in crypto i'm not invested in crypto i don't think i'm going to rush, rush there in a hurry okay. advice to those going to tier 2 colleges uh, glim tap first of all glim great lakes and tap me are not tier 2 colleges they are wonderful colleges um i keep telling this to several people who feel like they have missed out who feel like i could have been in college rank 8 but i'm going to college rank 20 simple rule Uh, college rank 8 if you are the top 10% of your batch uh, college rank 25 you are the f- top 1% of your batch you're probably going to the same place and so if you are median student in iim ahmedabad or the top 5% for person student in iim kodi code top 5% in iim kodi code is perhaps better you have a better shot at better colleges so make sure your cgpa is high make sure you learn tons of stuff be on the lookout for opportunities learn from fundamentals and hustle be out there you will go places the, the, the colleges in india what we defined as tier 2 they are excellent colleges they they offer wonderful value they teach well they, the economic prospects available for colleges is phenomenal when i was studying in, in engineering we guys used to think of it as abc grudgingly l and then i and k we would care about maybe fms and xlri we used to think about six colleges that were relevant now they're probably 60 and the prospect that we could be assured of joining the sixth college uh, the, that is worse on a like for like basis than a prospect that you can be assured of when you join the college rank 30 that's a generational advantage and so so grab it take it uh, if you feel um, a little bit of angst and say look i should have been in a better college make that angst count score well be academically brilliant it will take you places why can't indian b schools treat work ex like how foreign ones do uh, pressure is fine but having more than 4 years is wrong that to an age of uh, just 25 so i think indian b schools treat work experience really well 
I don't, I don't think there is a big problem there. I'll tell you where the difference comes. Uh, in several Western corporate environments, uh, after five, six years of experience, you automatically find yourself in a place, uh, unless in a place where you have a certain revenue responsibility. In Indian work environment, the revenue responsibility uh, comes a little late. And the revenue responsibility is the real deal. So if I'm recruiting somebody, and I, I see this in, in all honesty, I, I try to, whenever we recruit, I will pay a big premium happily for someone who is comfortable and with the idea of revenue responsibility. Someone who is very happy to say, this is what, this is the numbers I bring in. Someone who has worked for four years, six years, seven years in project management role in, in Infosys Wipro Cognizant, they're working brilliantly within a framework, within a system. But I'm not too sure that they've ever enjoyed or borne the pressures of revenue responsibility. And revenue responsibility is the real deal. And so you, if you're doing an MBA to, to graduate to a revenue responsibility role, if you have had revenue responsibility role in functional points, and then you go there. Uh, go doing an MBA, that's meaningful. So I find some of the experience that Indian aspirants have pre-MBA to be just years in the bank rather than with a compelling understanding of how business runs. I'm sometimes amazed at how agnostic to the idea of uh, commercial reason to exist of a company several employees are in small places and large. I've spoken, I've had conversations with people who have absolutely no idea of how their 30 member company makes money. They have no idea. They don't define their role in their terms. I'm not, I'm not averse to that. But if you want to do an MBA, if you want to say, I want to be in a business running role, then you need to have a clearer understanding of uh, the commercial boundaries of organizations. And I think Indian employees, uh, do not have a clear understanding of that at, at, at the two-year, three-year, four-year experiencing, which is probably why they're not, they're not treated like they have that. Shivam Tandon, one skill you would like to pick up at present? Um, several, several, several. I would, on, on a life skills basis, I would like to definitely learn to cook better and definitely like to parent better. Uh, those are the two things that I find I, <laughs> I'm not as good as I would like to be. Uh, being a partner better is, is good, but I think that ship is a little, uh, little gone by. Uh, in terms of uh, tangible professional skills, I think yeah, yeah, I, I've always wanted to learn math formally better. That's from something that I want to pick up. Uh, in the way I manage my time and my way I manage the boundaries of my business, um, the business that we, we run, I would like to learn to define that better. Those are the things that come up uh, top of my head. Nitish, PNC ke liye kya karna bahut, bahut dar lagta hai. PNC ke baare mein socho hi mat. Uh, PNC to ek question aata hai, do question aata hai. Don't worry about PNC, Nitish. Uh, Deepta, how do you mentally manage to stay in your 20s? That is flabbergasting. <laughs> I should, uh, if I should, I should definitely mention this to my son. He keeps calling me old. Uh, I have two kids. That really, really, really helps. I have a ridiculously young organization and the place where I work. These guys speak a language which I have to speak. That helps. There's no doubt about it. Um, I, I, I follow sport and I get engaged and engrossed in, in, in activities very easily. That helps. So the, the environment really shapes you. Partaking in kid activities with kids really helps. Sarthi, how do you beat procrastination? <laughs> you guys should really talk to my family. I am a big, big, big procrastinator. I'm a gigantic procrastinator. There's not practically very few things that I would rather do today than tomorrow. And if I can delay anything, I do it. So I'm, I'm, that is something that is my bugbear. I need to defeat it at some point of time. Something doesn't immediately catch my fancy. I wait for the mood to be right. And some, and when my daughter uses that phrase, I now realize how it drives me mad. <laughs> so I, I, I work in spurts. I'm committed to task. I have a ridiculously keen sense of, hey, this is what I need to bring to the table. This is mine. I can't pass the buck on this. I need to turn up for this. I can't let down my team for this. So I will turn up. But I'm not 
as disciplined as I would like to be and I'm not definitely not as time conscious as I would like to be. Sholay Bhutturiya, have you ever faced a rejection? Sholay Bhutturiya seems to come with an excellent question. Have you ever faced a rejection? How do we deal with that? Oh, plenty. Oh, plenty. I'm, uh, in my, after my MBA, I ended something like 25 interviews with 25 different companies and did not have a job. So we started with day zero, it was eight, six or eight companies. I attended all their interviews, bombed. Day one, slot one, day one, slot two, I bombed. And I attended all the interviews. My CV was good, my CGPA was good, my all-round ability was good. I was in placement committee. I was academically good. I, I, I knew my stuff. I, it is just that one of those things, I tanked interview after interview after interview. After a point, it was an autopilot. I was not geared, I was not thinking about jobs. I, I didn't have a clue about what an employee should know. I didn't have a clue about selling myself well to a to a recruiter in a 20 minute bucket. I didn't have the confidence to just say, look, I belong here, they should be recruiting me. So I was neither here nor there. Almost all my interviews, interviewers knew that I was sharp. And almost all of them didn't, no one felt a compelling need to punt on me. And this was 25 interviews, so it's a series of uh, rejections, which is, Obviously, of course, not fun. Uh, so it is a, it is a, I've, I've gone through that. Uh, how do we deal with them? We just pick ourselves up, launch ourselves to the next thing. Very often, my short memory with bad news really helps. So something doesn't go well for me, a couple of days later, I'm frequently have forgotten that. So I don't hang on to uh, negative ideas as much as I, I probably, people expect me to. So something bad would have happened, I just forget it. It helps. In some context, it's a weakness, frequently it's a strength. This is from Arman. Do you believe there's life after death? I'm ambivalent to that. I'm not super spiritual. I'm not super religious. I don't need an idea of uh, the possibility or not of life after death to come on how I, how I spend this time. So sometimes I find that uh, the life after death idea is a, it's a meaningful motivator for good behavior. And I get very annoyed. So if, there were, if you're sure that there's no life after death, would you be not motivated to be a decent guy. So, so, so I'm not, I, I don't find uh, that uh, to be a powerful notion for me. So I don't get about that. What is your favorite form of humor? I'm a uh, written word really appears to me. I think written word lots of time gets spent. So in movies, humor driven, driven by script appeal to me a, a lot. So I'm, um, uh, slapstick less so, contextual less so, script driven. Uh, so I love movies where the, the, the joke is in the, in the writing and delivered brilliantly. So I love TV shows which, which, are, which are based on that delivery. So I love quite a few sitcoms where the writing is good. But if the setting is good, if it is too slapstick, if it is because of um, a context or, or, or a visual thing, that doesn't appeal to me so much. Uh, Mohammed, when do you think Barcelona jinx at La Liga ends? Do players becoming managers be curtailed? I don't think Barcelona really have a jinx right now. They've not won for a couple of years. Last year, last season, they competed. Uh, last season, good news probably from a Barcelona fan's point of view is that Real Madrid didn't win. So I don't think there's as much in a funk as they have been in their past. So when they when they broke through in, I think, the, the, the right card time, they'd had a bad spell for years. Now they've had brilliant time. Their outlier is the Messi years. Messi was there for 16 years. That's an outlier for Barcelona's history. So they've never been an utterly dominant team in La Liga. They've always been second. And second to Real Madrid throughout. Messi made them catch up and look like an imposing phenomenal force because of the, 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 the power of Messi and the fact that Xavi, Iniesta and the rest of them are there. So, I, I don't think it jinxed territory yet. Not like they've gone without winning a title for 12 years or 10 years, hardly been 3 years, 2 years. They're not going to win this year, they didn't win last year, the year before that they competed. So, I'm not, it, 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 it's not panic stations yet. Particularly because I think the, the weakness that Barcelona are facing, La Liga is facing overall as well. Uh, and to some extent, Real Madrid as well. Both of them are going through a, a transition that they'll have to struggle to compete with the phenomenal power of the Premier League teams. These things go in cycles. So I'm not, uh, I don't think it's a jinx yet. Players becoming managers, why should it be curtailed? Players bring phenomenal flavor. Player managers are brilliant. 
Nadia Love's good. Xavi hopefully will be good. Rikard was good. Nothing against you. Nandakumar Rajendran, how was 2IM's transformation in virtual mode after COVID? Was it challenging? From a course delivery point of view, it was not. We were always running an online course. So we've been running an online course for seven years. We added live classes and made it a centerpiece pretty, pretty rapidly. It worked for us. And then we revamped our technology. It really helped us to, to say, okay, we'll deliver it differently. So we keep working on tech. We are heavy on tech. We invest a lot of time, energy, money on on getting the right devices, cleaning up our volume, uh, setting we on and setting up the live streaming flawlessly, using good software, good hardware, not compromising on vision when it comes to tech. So it was a it was not that difficult. The day to day was a pain. I don't like Zoom. I don't like conversations on phone. I don't do long sessions. I, I find myself nodding off, and I dramatically different in uh, in person. I can I like walking across, seeing, sitting next to the screen, talking to people, having a a real live discussion about hey we can do this we can tweak that we can change this picture we should edit like this we can transform like this let us think of the next big idea all of that i, I thrive on the people interaction so which is why I, I i do i like to be bang in the middle of the office so that i can be in the, in the hasty bagu. so that i missed i missed dramatically and i think several of us missed in, in our organization everything we like the idea of sitting together and, and, and planning out different things that we missed we sorely missed dearly missed some of the others scoped really well with that Take substitutes, I struggled. Vishnu, what is the one book which shapes the perception of your mind or a book which has influenced the way you think and work? Back when I was in very young, I, I read um, Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged and Fountainhead and all that. Uh, that made me fiercely capitalist, fiercely right-wing economist. Now I am dramatically in the other extreme. I, I, am very, I am almost borderline I'm left of center, I'm not left finger, I'm not a rabid communist, but I'm left of center when it comes to how economic activity should be should be planned. I believe passionately in, in government and institutions taking care of their poor, or looking out for the poor, giving them the opportunity, especially in poor countries like India. Our poor get trampled on, I'm, so I've become left of center. But back then, uh, in, in an impressionable age, it, it's, a, it's a powerful book. I'm not even sure it's the right book to read. I'm not sure it is as powerful an ideology. I think it's an ideology that is uh, does not stand up to scrutiny that much, but it's sold really well in that book. Uh, and and I, I got carried away. I got consumed by the power of the, the, the purity of the ideology. So that I like. Author, I think P.G. Woodhouse is uh, my favorite author. The book, one book that I'm a big, big fan of is uh, Catch-22. Very, very well written. Very I, wrote it, I read it when I was in college. I just simply didn't get it. In four or five years later, I picked up the book and read it, and I can I can reread it any number of times. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. That's a book that gives me a lot of reference points for, for my own life. Uh, again, from Vishnu, I'm a South Indian, so are you. What do you feel about uh, our South Indian temples? Oh, very good places of architecture, uh, places where the, the, the local subculture and routines and traditions are well maintained. Several of those are... Uh, not dazzling, but well maintained, which is kind of the, the, the style I like. Not ostentatious, but neat, clean. Stand for what they stand for. Good community places. You get a good feeling when you go to a bunch of these temples. Right? Did you visit any great ancient temples? I have gone to quite a few temples. I grew up in an Orthodox South Indian family, so. 50% of family vacations are temple trips. So you have seen almost all the temples near Tanjavur or Kumbhakonam. I've gone to all of them. I've gone to Tirupati a bunch of times. So I've definitely seen many of them, several of them. Uh, back then, I didn't like them. Of course, you're with your cousins. You want to play. And then they drag you out in a big van and say, this is a glorious temple and this god is very powerful. The kind of ideas that don't appeal to 12-year-olds who are thinking cricket. Uh, but I understand the, the, the communal angle of temples and, and the idea of uh, visiting a temple to give uh, peace and quiet for people. It's a very place way of just seeing architecture. It does appeal to me. Do you believe in God and karma in limited context? Yes, I'm not fiercely religious. I'm not atheistic. I, I'm not agnostic either. So I'm in between agnostic and mildly religious. So I, I don't think I, we need, I need an idea of a God to keep me on the straight and narrow. Uh, but I, I think that the idea of a, of a more powerful being can 
can be humbling and therefore faith is a powerful force like that karma i would like to believe karma exists and karma is there karma plays a role um, I, I am not given to counting my goods and minuses and saying, okay, today I got a good day. I just kicked one person, but I've given donation to three people. I don't think the math works like that. But what you sow is what you reap is the is central premise of, uh, of, of karma. I would like to believe that it exists. I'm not leading my life under the assumption very confidently one way or the other. I'd like to believe that there is some payoff for doing good things. My message to the millennials and all that. Look, I don't. Look, we should just, I read one. I heard one very interesting quote by Amitabh Bachchan, and somebody asked him a question and said, "Look, you're asking me a question on a really complex issue, and I'm not equipped to to handle this. I'm a movie star. I know that. So this issue, I'm not the guy." Uh, and then Amitabh Bachchan goes on to hawk several products. Hopefully, I won't end up doing that. Uh, but look, I'm not the person. I'm not the person to answer deep. Religious, spiritual questions. I'm not equipped to handle that. Uh, how do you maintain work-life balance rather poorly? Actually, just kidding. Uh, reasonably okay. I think I have a, a schedule at home. I do have time for uh, the kids. I, I have some time for myself as well. I'm in rather poor physical shape. I've had a bad COVID. I can't. I'm. A, I like moving out and meeting people and playing and talking and running is being constrained in a set of closed spaces is getting on my nerves uh, so I've, I've lost my fitness dramatically in the last 24 months hopefully i'll pick up the pieces and, and get going on that that is the one piece in the jigsaw that has been very poor for for me uh, and family so I, I we need to figure out a way to do that but that apart work life balances how do how do i do that i don't get carried away with work i can i can put it aside i'm very very good at saying hey there's a problem here this is big this is huge uh, this is going to be defining i'll worry about it tomorrow it sometimes drives people around me crazy that i can just say <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm i'm good at saying look this i can't change anything anyway now i'll switch off my boss when i was in banking said you have a very very pleasant hindu way of thinking about things that was his impression of what what the Hindu wave was. But there were times in my bank when, when there would be emails which said, look, uh, we are preparing for retrenchment. So counseling services are available for people who are worried. Uh, we have this and 6% of our workforce is going to be rationalized. Uh, so do reach out to us in case you need help. That will come as a mass communication to all 10,000 people who are in that place. And very often I would be completely indifferent to the idea of that. Probably because I was not madly attached to my job. It helps. Uh, but I was like, this is a job. It doesn't define me. If I get it, I get it. If they pay me well, good. If I don't pay me well, I can go to another place. I'll take that. If 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 it doesn't work and I have to start, I'll start. I'll do something else. I was confident in my ability to figure out some mechanism for myself. But I'm not too consumed in the idea of doing well on a quarter to quarter, month by month basis. So it, it, it this is not the only thing that I can be worried about. And that I've been... It has kind of come naturally to some extent. Uh, being an entrepreneur changes that. Your, your quarter on quarter revenues as a company matter more to you than a month on month performance appraisal in some bank. Absolutely no doubt about it. The biggest challenge being entrepreneurial is that the buck stops with you in, on several items at the same time all the time. And so there is a sense of uh, pressure that comes cripplingly from that. There's no doubt about it. So that's why that's a big challenge, I think. Several people who want to be entrepreneurs uh, underestimate. There's a certain 24 by 7-ness to it. It is simply not there for, for jobs. You find your mechanisms. You say, hey, he can, he can. Worst comes to worst, we'll survive. Why should one <laughs> marry at all? Once again, I'm not the expert on this. Uh, a sense of companionship, a, a shared journey. Uh, it's not <coughs> as... Um, Cut and right, I'm not all in favor of marriage or all against marriage, any which way. Uh, no one course decision is per se better than the other. And it's heavily individual dependent. But you're here, you're going to go through a journey. Might as well have a, a companion for it. If it turns out to be a super compatible companion, brilliant. 
but you should give yourself a chance of finding some form of compatible number. Yeah, definitely. Should you always be politically correct in personal interview? Yeah, why would you not be? This is it's a trade-off. It's a 20-minute thing. You don't have to give away your strong views about uh, the hijab in that 15-minute snapshot. So sometimes I think uh, we should dial down our intent to provoke uh, that we usually peddle in the name of honesty. This is what I feel about. Why do I suppress it? You're not being dishonest to yourself, but not shooting off your mouth at the first opportunity. Sometimes political correctness is, is, is made to look like it is one phenomenally bad, bland thing. I think political correctness is don't say something stupidly provocative in the next 15 minutes. That's all it's about. Don't say something stupidly provocative in 15 minutes. I think that's an easily achievable bar. That is something that everybody should aspire to. An interview hall is not something to brandish your staunch credentials as a left finger, right finger, religious, atheist, any of those. It's not. It's not what you're there for. Your philosophical discussions, somewhere else. And very often I find even the deep discussions are, are more provocative than enlightening. And so we should need to know, is it meaningful? Am I open to having my mind change? If the answer is no, you shouldn't, you have no business partaking in any discussion. You can, is it impossible to get decent sleep in IAMs? I slept well. It's all bakwas. You can sleep well. You manage your time well, you can sleep well. You don't manage your time well, you can still sleep well. Several times you don't you end up not sleeping well because you, you engage in a long discussion or you're so worried about getting B plus instead of B minus or you are out partying and wasting your time. And otherwise you can find sleep. There'll be the odd week that gets cripplingly tight. Such is life, roll with it. This whole thing that the first term in IIM Ahmedabad really finds out who you are about. It's about handling that stress and lack of sleep and pushing you to the boundaries. You should, you should see what doctors do when they are doing their, their, their rounds. This is nothing. We can't hold a candle to that. It is all bakwas. It's just made up into a, a mythical high intensity environment and they revel in it. Sometimes I feel for no good reason. When it's very imminently survivable, if you want to get good CGPA and excel in this and participate in that and be in this club and revel in your own glory of not sleeping enough, you can find that. There are several people who are that. The, the, the mahal and the environment and the setting drives you towards that. But you can find your balance and by the time you're in third semester, you're comfortable. Your fourth, fifth, sixth semesters, you spend most of your time goofing off. The sixth trimesters, the last two are bakwas, which is goofing off time. It's a fourth trimester thing. It's nothing. Pratapa Vaishnavi, uh, marriage or career, I would like to think that is not an either or. Right? So most people from typical Indian families face this. Your views on this. Uh, it is tricky. I'm not going to push it under the carpet. It is far, far, far trickier for women than for men uh, for a bunch of reasons. One is the way the system is defined, the way expectations and roles are defined. Those are tractable, changeable things and moldable things. Uh, but stuff like if you want a family, that part of it is not negotiable. Especially if you want a family, the husband and wife are there and the, or a couple is there and they say, they, I want a family. That one way or the other, it's a, it's a give or take two are right off for each child that you want to have. The peak of your learning and earning capacity career span. So from 25 to 40, in some form, um, two, two years per child minimum, you're going to take a back seat. That's a big call. So some make a ferocious, crystal clear call and say, look, no family. At least we'll, we'll be a couple, but no children. And this for no commitment. And I'm throwing everything into my career. Which I think is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a decision. If it works for them, it works for them. But that's not the decision the vast majority go for. So we have to find a way of balancing these two. It is tricky. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to sit and say, look, the government or the private sector has to bear the entire cost of the fact that this, 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 the people want to have families. And to the economic cost of having Paternity pay or maternity pay cannot fall on the entrepreneur. If it does fall, then I can tell you as an entrepreneur, I will start recruiting people who will not give me that problem. It's going to happen. Look, it can't be my cost to bear. I'm paying. And if I don't get traction or return for it, then I'm not going to do that. So I'll find, the government will look askance at me and say, look, why have we not borne the maternity cost? 
next cycle i'll make sure that i recruit only people who will never give me a maternity burden it's going to happen so you can't put the burden of the cost on the private sector the burden of cost cannot unilaterally fall on the government either because then it will be subsidizing one visa with the other and then pushing one agenda over the other getting uncomfortable it will get uncomfortable at any level government should play a role private sector should play a role government should subsidize government should help government should provide child care to some extent private sector should be accommodating should should find ways of handling this but the largest burden frequently is borne by families and mothers so we should have a some clarity about this we should 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 more or less take the decision of the family knowing fully well the transparency really helps at two years or three years you're going to you you suppose you're a wonderfully aspirational 27 year old who's going to 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 with the rest of your peer group 28 get married at 31 you have a child in 30 to 32 it's you can't go all out you're going to say okay this is a part and i don't want to lose out therefore i'm taking a back seat on that that doesn't make me lesser person i'm not glorifying one or the other but the more information and transparency there is to the person themselves perhaps easier it could be to stomach the inevitable thing that not which sending governmental support and private sector support and supportive spouses all of which have question marks right next to them the big part of the burden is going to be borne by women that is because of the, the nature of child bearing and caring so therefore at the very least the decision should be articulated and, and, and taken the system has to do whatever it can to support i think it's getting better at this now than it was 20 years ago But, but there's only that much the private sector can do the burden cannot be on the private sector burden cannot be on the entrepreneur it's only that much poor governments can do spouses and families can do frequently do but it is still a small it's a part of the reality which is quite a tricky decision is mba a good choice for a person from a middle class family this is from ragavi most definitely yes if you get a good college uh, the roi is a good your pay packet your money you make the trajectory you have the lifestyle you have the way your mind gets shaped all of that gets better but definitely no doubt about it from a good college ajinkya so did you have a girlfriend at the time of <laughs> my cat prep was in the previous millennium my friend i did my engineering in a college where there were 400 people and 25 girls so the demand supply curve demand supply equation was completely against me at the best of times i would not have had a good chance these were not the best of times i was at my geeky gawky worst and the, the numbers were not in my favor easily no not even close <laughs> shubangi is it bad not to dream big wanting to live a simple and uh, comfortable life having fun focusing on personal life and a decent package and position shubangi in some way or the other you have defined the scope of your question brilliantly you basically made me say hey to each everyone if you are defining your boundaries very clearly and saying look i want to have this balance and i want the balance to be more towards uh, fun and happiness and less towards personal ambition defined by this i, I would say uh, power to you i i would go to the extent of saying this is dreaming big the real big dream is the one to lead a fun happy fulfilling life and that probably the toughest cookie to crack several people take the ambitious career growth thing as a proxy for this because there's more measurable and tangible they think that will give them fulfillment there's often not found in that either so uh, there is absolutely no monopoly on what route one should take to find find happiness or satisfaction or thrill it is definitely completely viable to say look i don't want to have a gigantic professional ambition i want to have good balance good fun i want to be able to put my feet up and say take one day off and not worry about this i don't want the next promotion or the a plus rating or the or extra bonus i'm taking it easy and having a fabulous trajectory which is at my own pace and have fun on my own compellingly good reason to choose this path absolutely no doubt about it shivam tanan why do you think indian comics never took off ah <sighs> why do you think indian comics never took off not thought about this at all right? the, the the tinkle and digest i think they, they played a role 
I don't know whether you're talking about comics of that time or graphic novels. The Amar Chitra Kathas and the Tinkles, they have carved a niche for themselves. They are there. I think if you're talking about comics like Batman, I think uh, the Batman fantasy as a subculture. The, the graphic novel, comic, Marvel universe the subculture has really taken off only in the last 25 years. Not, not before that. Not before Iron Man 1, 2, 3 were comics so mainstream even in the US. So the several times that they've come close to not making any serious money. And so I wouldn't, it was a nerdy, geeky kind of your, your nerd kid would like those comics but nobody else really cared about that. Only the last 20 years, 25 years they've become super mainstream. So I don't know whether that time will come for India. I've not really thought about it. Secret behind your hair is genetic. I think uh, not having a receding hairline is one of the things that my gene tradition touch wood. I hope God doesn't take vengeance on me because I've been bragging online. Uh, I've done nothing. <laughs> so one of those luck things. Uh, favorite actor? Mainstream Hindi, Amir Khan, I like. Tamil, I like Kamalasan. More recent I think Danush is very capable in Tamil. Um, in, in specific roles, I've liked people. On my, uh, in, in Hey Ram, I thought Atul Kulkarni did a brilliant job. Like that, that, that strand, that, uh, that, 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 that part, that component he brought to the table. Um, I'm a big fan of Nazruddin Shah. The, the way he can, he can nuance and show within, the, without being, Histrionically, uh, without being over the top, you can bring in nuance. I think it's a rare trait. You know, understated acting is a very rare trait, especially in the Indian setting. I think he does uh, brilliantly at that. Why did you resign your uh, IB job? Any tips to get into IB jobs? Uh, investment banking jobs, I didn't, I didn't like it much. Uh, I wasn't thrilled by it. I didn't get an intellectual kick. I didn't get any job satisfaction kick. Um, they gave me plenty of money kick. I was getting caught into a lifestyle which I was not uh, really taken in by. I knew always that the lifestyle that my wife and I wanted, we didn't need she know, humongous salary. Uh, I always wanted to be in the education sector. Therefore, it's a combination of factors. Tips to get into an IB job, do well academically. Do well academically. If you're in an MBA, do be in the top 10%. If you're a chartered accountant, do well in your job. If you're preparing for CA, be at anchor. So the roots is to stand out academically. Anonymous girl, could you please talk about doing PhD after MBA? I'm thinking to make my career in Oh, it's a wonderful, wonderful option. We get fabulous FPM options in Imam Dabad, Bangalore, Calcutta. Far less uh, lower percentile cutoff. Good course, well defined. It's heavily dependent on your teacher. But if you get a good prof, it's, it's a wonderful journey. They let you dwell on ideas to let you think about academics the, the route to both industry and academia is well defined you can work in the industry for a few years then go to academia or the other way around uh, it's uh, the, the scoping of what you are about is more in your hands if you want to do a phd but the iams the top few definitely offer a beautiful platform the professors know their stuff the setting is good um, the, the stipend and hostel take care of themselves if you, if you feel like you could have a compellingly good career in academia, you like that, then the FPM is a very good option. Sir, why are colleges having a predilection towards non-engineers and females and scrapping off the merit that male engineers get with effort? They are not scrapping off the effort that male engineers do this. It's, it's, they firmly believe that uh, diversity brings something to their classroom pool. They firmly believe that. It's not made up. It's not dressed up to look like that. They firmly believe that. And so, I'll give you an analogy. You could be, uh, all of us have some favorite foods. Right? So, for me, it's dosa. Right? And for you, it could be alu butter, alu butter. So, it could be whatever it is. And you say, look, I'm going to have dosa every day, Monday to Friday, morning and evening. I know, I'm sure. By Saturday, I'll be like, look, let me try an idli or a puri, something else. I'll try chole bhature. So, that variety add something it will add something to my dosa experience next time around so they are not saying i'm anti-engineers they're just saying i don't want 70 percent of my batch to be engineers 
So first of all, we need to, as engineers, I'm an engineer, and I've been super aggrieved by this. Right? And I've been um, asked rapid questions when I was 21, 23 uh, in college. I've had some of my girl classmates and I'm like, why should I believe your, your IQ brought you here instead of something else? So I've asked that question. I've known them well. So they have treated me kindly. And they've argued their corner really well. And some of them, in some ways, they've changed my mind, they've changed my opinion. But uh, it is very important to understand that there is no agenda here, first of all. They're not anti-ingenious as much as they want to say, I cannot have 70% of my batch being ingenious. They're not anti-men as much as saying, I want to have 20% of my batch or 25% of my batch to be females. We just had a, uh, a discussion on family and career. Does, they, does there need to be a trade-off? We said, look, women are making that choice. They're having to make that choice more so than men. So the system has to support and offset it in some form. One of those offsetting mechanisms is admissions into B schools. So there are more women candidates. The companies will recruit more. Companies will define policies to accommodate the fact that people have families. And it's a very important fact. People do have families. And so all of you men out there, when you when you get married and you have children and you recognize that at some point of time, a slightly higher share or a significantly higher share of child care is borne by the woman. Child hiring is definitely borne by the woman. Men role in that is minimal. And so... Therefore, there's a certain level of inbuilt breaks into the career of women automatically. And there are several constraints that women face that men don't acknowledge. Therefore, they're saying, look, I want to offset this balance a little bit. And I feel that women bring something to the table that uh, maybe typically all men don't. Therefore, they're firmly rooting for the sake of diversity and it's not anti-engineer or anti-male. Very important, very important. And the biggest problem the world has now, one of the biggest problems that the world has now, is the victim complex of the majority community. Everywhere in the world it's happening. And the, the, everywhere, it's across the world, the majority grouping in any subsetting, they are feeling like they are being, being victimized. 25 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, it was the other way around. Now it is this way. It is very important to know that every shop or privilege or uh, uh, offsetting thing given to one sub-segment is not per se motivated by anti the main incumbent. It's not anti-engineers as much as a SOP given to non-engineers, as much as a SOP given to the women. So one premise that they are firmly believe in at, a, at an intellectual level, not because they want to, to showcase something, is diversity. They firmly believe that having different kinds of people from different walks of life, different geographies, different locations, different languages, different subcultures actually makes a difference. They believe that and they do a lot of research pre-post with data and numbers. And I think they're entitled to that belief. They've had it verified. First of all, we've got to say they're anti-engineers. They're not. And they're not. It happens to be that engineers are the biggest incumbent group. Anytime you create mechanisms to create room outside, the incumbent group struggles. That's the nature of groups and so the the price is born but it's not because there's an agenda against male engineers it's very important to keep in mind um, the the challenges faced by women or disadvantaged communities are there and sometimes we feel based on one uh, one anecdotal example we feel like look i went to school my friend went to school both of us had the same upbringing throughout and, but he can get into a college at 75. I need to get 97. It's true. Correct. Very often, some of these spillover advantages are, are enjoyed by a small percentage of people who are the ones who are utterly, completely undeserving of getting an advantage. It's the nature of life. Uh, but within that community, within that sub-segment, I think women have some pressures in some form or other that uh, young men perhaps do not completely understand. So when... when, when and system is making that advantage. Give the credit to the fact that these professors, these systems, these admission committees have thought long and hard about this. You care about merit in a system. The guy's been running the place. He's a director. He care about the merit of every single person entering that system. They think of this as a responsibility to the country. They don't take admission process lightly. 
they worry about every candidacy they worry about where they go 10 years from now 25 years from now they have reams of data to fall back on to they are not willingly sacrificing merit to run an agenda they believe that diversity plays a role they believe that women bring something to the table that is essential for men and they 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 have their head and heart in the right place so sometimes the the, the if you are not appreciative or completely not clear about why it's happening give them the benefit of doubt any which way don't think of this as a as something where you have been victimized for some reason i mean as you look like tamil film director gautam masthi even <laughs> just when i thought the chat was going very well and so thanks but no thanks and what's the future of government jobs in india they'll be there the power of government has increased in the pandemic i'm deeply resentful of government role and government creep in industry i become i said i've become left of center i think we need to take care of our poor we need to subsidize we need to help we need to have big education centers health care should be low priced all that i believe in but the moment the government guy is empowered the party guy gets empowered and i have been in a state where party is king so if party is king government is beholden to the party government becomes a form of patronage like royalty like kingdoms it's a pain in the neck uh, but the government has supreme power and control over the resources of the country they determine the taxes they determine where money is spent they determine how money is spent they determine how much each of us has to chip in and th- that power i don't see it fading any time soon governments whether be this party or that party they know how to make the system work for themselves when they are in power they have been good at it they have years at this they are not going to yield power that easily the occasions like the pandemic creep our avenues for government to creep in and take more power our fiscal spending has gone through the roof there are no checks and balances every time our our finance minister comes and says we've had record gst collections and people clap at it i go i get livid you take money from us and you are celebrating for that and why is this a big deal that the gst collections are through the roof basically saying i'll take a bigger cut of the economy and i'll keep it for myself so that i can spend on priorities the government things are good so i'm annoyed with that but sometimes i'm a fan of the us because they're so rapidly distrustful of their government machinery their their gun, gun act is based on that they feel like citizens should have the ability to arm themselves if they have to one day get together and overturn a government they are that worried about government overreach and so i am very worried about government overreach precisely for that reason i can tell you that governments really like government overreach and they will continue to do that which is why government jobs will rule in india for a while the power is good money is also going to be good why do iit i am grad start a cat coaching nonsense iit i am grad probably out of 1000 of them two of them will be in cat coaching and there'll be 10 of them in who are running hospitals 15 of them are running 25 of them are running restaurants i don't think there is an affinity to cat coaching as much as to any other sector and so several cat coaching companies have iit iim grads of course they do iit iim grads know this business well there is a certain credibility that they bring to the table they are good probably at what they do they carve a space for themselves if people come to two iim it has nothing to do with the fact that i am from iit and iim it might be a starting point for them to offer curiosity to explore if i teach piss poor and our tech is not good our customer service is not good counseling is not good they won't touch us with the barge pole it's a it's a curiosity thing and it might come in if you deliver you are good you'll survive otherwise you're out it's so very clear so i don't think iit iim grads have any affinity towards cat coaching they don't is it just a passion for teaching passion for teaching is manifested in teaching not necessarily cat coaching there are several iit iim grads are there in the education sector only very few are there in cat coaching several in cat coaching are iim grads that's natural jatin um, i think it's jatin gangwani hi jatin if you wake up and find yourself uh, turn into rajnikanth one fine morning what will you do uh, revel at my legacy have a big smile on my face walk around with a swollen head be filled with uh, joy and pride at, uh, at what i have accomplished not care give two hoots about not doing well in politics sit back and revel in my, um, my fantastic cinematic career think about the next movie i would want to make uh, see if i can wield my enormous power and substantial wealth to to some meaningful causes create a, a 3.0 that will be my legacy 
I know that my legacy is not politics anymore, but it can be some other cause that I find close to my heart. Uh, I will I will spend the next 15 years, 10 years, or however long I'm alive to to carve my legacy. My cinematic legacy is insured. My bank balances are assured. My my comforts are taken care of. And my popularity is never going to fade away. I'm, I'm I'm good and comfortable, thrilled and happy. I can't stop smiling about all that. But therefore, I'll chase on the next new thing. If you were to go invisible, what is the first thing you would do? I haven't the faintest idea. I haven't really thought about it. I would have sought several vicarious pleasures when I was younger. Uh, when, you, when you have a family and have two kids, that, those are not the kind of things that you want to do. Uh, I don't know whether what, what invisibility. I would like to be a fly on the wall for several discussions, several people, several things. I would want to know what is really going on in, in discussions, in, 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 in uh, leaders rooms, leaders' houses, what is uh, Putin saying to his investor, to his elite committee, what is Joe Biden saying, what is our own prime minister talking with uh, this, uh, this, this, this protege or his number two. I would want to be a fly in the wall, on the wall to listen into all of these things and get that information, be happy and, and, and revel in my own wisdom. Uh, but that is what I would chase probably. Um, hi from Kaveri Hostel. I'm from Godavari. So, hi, hi, hi. Uh, favorite TV shows? I, I saw this question before. Plenty of them. Plenty of them. Uh, I like several of the sitcoms. I, I really liked Friends I was in, when I was in college. Uh, recently, I've taken to watching The Big Bang Theory. I find it hilarious. Um, I've watched a few TV series in Indian. I really liked uh, The Family Man. But I really liked The Criminal Justice more than even Family Man. It was very well made. Uh, scripting. Lovely. Um, one of my all-time favorite shows is something called West Wing, which I thought was fantastically well written by, by Aaron Sorkin. Ran for eight seasons, it was gripping, uh, cutting edge stuff. It was a long time ago. They were absolutely phenomenal in, 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 in capturing that setting. It was a brilliant, brilliant show. One of my all-time favorite shows is The West Wing. But I watched several of across genres, I've watched several. I've watched thriller series, I've watched uh, a comic series. Suhas has been pushing me to watch Chernobyl, but I've not done yet. Maybe soon I will. Uh, but I like sitcoms. I've watched several sitcoms. Um, uh, West Wing is my one of my favorites. Recently, I watched Big Bang Theory. I like the Patallo, Criminal Justice, Family Man, all of them. Uh, Delhi Crime, all of them. But Criminal Justice is slightly more special than the others. I am Blackie is everyone's aim. What about FMS Delhi? Oh, FMS Delhi is in the mix. It's one, it's not that expensive. The ROI is easy. It's an easy decision if you want to be an entrepreneur. Any which way it is in the top four, top five. Right. Yes, and there, why is 10th and 12th score taken into consideration? Doesn't it punish us for things that we have already learned from and grown? Why not? Why, why should, see, whenever we think about 10th and 12th, we've got to keep in mind that uh, the other metric available to us is a CAT score. The 10th and 12th, is a formative crucial year exam. The CAT scores are two are hit. Why should I give more credence to CAT score than 10th and 12th? More than the idea of 10th and 12th, it is 10th and 12th. 10th, 12th UG. So I look at your track record over an eight year period and over a two hour exam. Anytime you're saying, why are we giving this importance or this more importance? Vis a vis what? Vis a vis the CAT score. If you're arguing for less importance of 10th and 12th, you're arguing for more importance for a two hour exam. If that 10th and 12th is not important, why is this CAT score important? Right. One. Two, you've said, what are the things that you've done from, uh, already learned from and grown? We are very, very usually, we want to draw a line and say, look, I made a mistake. Done. We've dealt with it. I've dealt with it. Let me go to the next one. But if it's one off, usually it, it, it gets forgiven. If your 10th, 12th or UG is a little low, it's forgiven. But if 10th is 94, but the 12th one is 78 and UG CGPA 7.1, then it's not as much as a blip as a trajectory. It says you like it when things go your way, but you don't have the ability to fight back when things get rough. And I've seen academic correlation, correlation between academic success and diligence and ability to deliver on jobs to be very high. The, the great flair idea giver rarely sees through a project. The, the genius who comes up as a problem solver can't sit and define his role every week, every month, week after week, month after month for years. And if I'm looking to recruit for a career, I want diligence more than flair. 
I want somebody who's disciplined more than a genius. Right? So therefore, I want balance. I want the ability to bounce back, ability to come back and, and hang in there. That the longer track record gives me. The correlation between academic success and, and professional success is high, much higher than people think it is. Uh, Kevin, senior level marketing roles versus top level investment banking roles. What are your overall thoughts about these jobs? Depends on the place you are working, depends on the canvas you want, depends on what gives you the kicks. Uh, you will realize that as, as you go higher and higher in your career, the, the, the marketing jobs, revenue and finance responsibility is high. The finance jobs, marketing responsibility is supremely high. The top investment banking jobs you have, you are, you are relentlessly hawking yourself. You are selling your brand as a deal maker. So you could be a deal maker in a sector, you could be an analyst in, a, in an industry, in a, in, a, in a vertical, or you could be the guy who moves the market. Any which way, you're selling your brand. So all of us know Rakesh Junjunwala because Rakesh Junjunwala has marketed Rakesh Junjunwala better than be a, a great stock picker. And so it is heavily about marketing. So the, the, the role definitions are not so clearly just marketing or just finance. What gives you the kicks, that will be the thing that you will drive towards. Ha, sir, what are your failures in life? Not a confessional, my friend. YouTube channel is to talk about all the good things. Uh, failures, plenty. Uh, not having, uh, on a personal habit level, I, I get worked up frequently. I get impatient with the, with the kids. As a, as a person and partner, probably I've not been uh, uh, balanced on occasion. I've gotten carried away with one thing or the other, been too impulsive without processing things through. Uh, as an individual, I'm not as organized or as disciplined as I would like to be. It's an issue. As, a, as an entrepreneur, I've not been um, as ambitious as I might have been in crucial moments and as driven as I could have been in, with, a, with a clearer execution plan as I could have had crucial moments. I get carried away with, with, a, with an idea rather than thinking anally about execution. I, I would not put any of this as a big failure. And by, by most standards, I'm not a major failure. So I don't, I don't want to humble brag and say I failed in this majorly. It's all right. Life goes on. I'm not a big hit or an example in anything, but I'm not a failure either. What is your age? Unfair. Deep time. 42. I'm 41. I'm going to 42. If not at tech, where you would have found yourself? I wouldn't. I don't think I've, I would have been happy with a job. When I was in a banking job, I would have taken that. If I'd been, I, prior to that, I was in a sales job. I've taken that. I am reasonably capable of grinding my way through a job and enjoying myself in that job in that context, not letting that bother me and finding something else. I would have probably found an avenue to teach somewhere or the other. I like teaching math. I could have been working in a bank and teaching math on the weekends or creating good questions and, and doing something with maybe a YouTube channel. So that would have been my get out of jail clause. And this is what I enjoy doing. Double down on that. And work and get a pay for whatever I was doing, delivering on that front. So I think I would have found a mix like that. It would have added salary from one place and happiness and kicks from another place. That would have worked. Uh, investment banking might have been the obvious choice because I've done that. And for all my cribs, I, I did reasonably well in that. I had enough to survive and do well and have a 20-year career in investment banking. It's not rocket science. I might not never have been the gold star banker, but I would have merely survived and done well and gone from associate to director to whatever that, that, that career progression is, I would have gone through that. Muthu, would you buy LIC shares on its IPO? I have the same test idea, my friend. I have not invested in an IPO ever. So I don't know. What do you think of the current Indian stock market trends? I don't know. I don't know whether it's P is high or low. I would love to see a bunch of companies which I think are weirdly uh, um, not value adding to, to struggle. I think a bunch of companies that are new in the new age economy have captured the imagination of investors and consumers and are not really reliant on sound business models or good business practices. I, it seems like I, I sound like a bitter guy, but I would love to see a bunch of them go bust. But that apart, I don't have a I don't have skin in the stock market game. Arvind, you're a business person and you're surrounded with them. Why not add basic business courses on the learning platform you've already built? See, I, 
I'm I might be a decent doctor, but I won't know how to teach medicine. So people know one thing, but just knowing one thing and knowing to teach one thing are dramatically different things. I'm I, I, I'm very comfortable teaching quant or logical thinking or building pedagogy for that, uh, and I love that. That's that my thing. If there is one thing that I'm super confident that I'll be uh, among the best in doing is in teaching that across levels. So if you want me to teach math to six-year-old, seven-year-old kids, I'll be thrilled to bits and I'll come up with methods to engage them and build abstract thinking in them. Six hundred, seven hundred kids, I'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best in the world in creating pedagogy. That's my dream. That's what I want to do. And I'm super confident that I not only know the fundas, I have an intuitive grasp of the fundas and I have the ability to break and reconstruct that so that the next person can get the intuitive grasp of the fundas. And so I'm very confident of that. But if it is something else, I, one, I don't know whether I'm good in business. Two, I don't know whether I have a grasp intuitively of how business models work. And three, I don't know how to, whether I can crack the idea of teaching this. So, so definitely no. Have you seen Black Mirror? No. How to love quant? Do it from first principles. You love quant. Stop and dwell on ideas. Draw connections. Draw links. You will love quant. Ravi, why did you not go to the US for higher education? Back when I was studying in college, the higher education to US route was for MS. And I've said several times over, in engineering, I was not a good engineering student. I was, um, I love my maths and physics. And I think one of those, one of those uh, conceptually comfortable guys was happy dealing with ideas and uh, less at home with the physicality that is super important for engineers. And I had a friend who was a mechanical engineer uh, whose idea of a good summer vacation day would be to uh, rip out its cycle and put it back together again. I, I, I work with uh, our accountant who's, who's, who's a, an accountant by training who loved to assemble furniture and rip apart hardware and put it back together again and understand how uh, a new fan can be fitted beneath a ramp. And, and, and that, that level of detail and screwing in and being physically present and working unnerves me. So I was temperamentally simply not an engineer. But as I was concept happy idea, I was a pure sciences guy. And I, therefore engineering, I didn't take to it. I didn't learn it well. I didn't uh, coast through it. I didn't do well in it. So it was, it was one of those things that I didn't want to build further on. So the master's MS was ruled out. And back then there was no MBA abroad. You don't have, you didn't have the money for that. Therefore, MBA. Ha! Thoughts on recent controversy in Karnataka. Once again, another topic that I'm, I'm not equipped to, to handle. But I'll still have my two cents. I think it's, 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 it's uh, I, I, there's complete lack of nuance in this. Fine. I'll tell you what I'm getting peeved with. Uh, the, the controversy is based on an attire. Lots of people have said people should be allowed to wear whatever they want. Who are you to control? Nobody is controlling what you want to wear in your house. But there is a uniform. And therefore, the, the idea that everybody wears the same thing, that is the idea we are contending against. You cannot showcase 100 examples of whether people should be allowed to wear whatever they want. People should be allowed to wear whatever they want. When they are there in their house, their balconies, their buildings, their societies, their malls, their beaches. Whatever they want within boundaries of decency and all that. But if there's a school or, or a, you can't say I'll wear whatever I want if I'm part of the army, part of the military. So the institution has a governing role in determining what they call as uniform. So we need to understand and appreciate that this is not the response for that. Having said that, I think the idea of the hijab being there is simply not such a big deal. I cannot imagine how it is such a big compromise on my ability to function that someone is wearing one head scarf. It's not. If you pause to think about it, it's not. So the, the several layers of reactions to it, my gut feel is they are motivated by far more powerful reasons and powerful forces than by the idea of all institutions not having the power or empowerment being taken away or any of these stuff. So there are, there are, there are, there are political forces in action which enjoy and, and and, and are in the business of trading these blows. And so we should understand that and take our amnest effort to not be among the group that is also trading the blows. And there is one blow being landed, 
and one blow being taken and just weakens both sides but it always strengthens the, the guy who likes the idea of people landing blows on each other so anytime these contacts are created super important for us to say this particular thing is not so important as the 103 other things that are happening right now in my life and and just keep one step back the the complete lack of nuance i get peeved with the institutions have the freedom to to say hey we will set standards on what is uniform the institutions should have the freedom should have the ability to use judgment and say hey we won't restrict this because it's not such a big deal what is your opinion about mba and iim which is iit iit is a far more tough academically rigorous environment than iim iim is i won't say it's a, it's a faulto degree it's tough ridiculously painful difficult but not academically intelligent so the, the competence is architectural can i put these things together and survive and put something compelling rather than can i solve this problem and, and, and create something new so there are different challenges but the iit is way more rigorous and tough academically than the iim this is from uh, paritosh uh oh i think the question is regarding iit mba rather than iim no, better colleges are are better so i think iit madras would rank iit madras bombay delhi would rank higher than iims i think there's no distinction as as iit and iim is wherever the higher colleges better ranked college that's going to be better next question from vignesh how do you manage time i'm rather uh, i'm a little poor on on time management i'm not the best i have um, burst of productivity and lulls following them sometimes when i sometimes i i want to write a good email and it takes me 3 4 hours to draft two paragraphs i walk i do this i, I get into a block i get into a funk i switch off i watch some tv i watch some sport i watch some absurd stuff on youtube just to say okay it's not working i'm going to take a break i take several of those breaks over periods of time which are long enough i think i'm reasonably productive on a sustained basis but on a on a day to day basis i'm uh, i have my ups and downs and dramatically so and therefore i'm not that good at managing my time so i i try to be relentless i'll never let go of a theme i'll keep hanging back coming back so i have to create 40 good questions and i have given myself two weeks i'll keep at it i'll never let go but i can't do five questions a day eight days be done with it doesn't work for me oh there's a, a rapid fire round so i'm going to read these questions is that how the format is just read and answer so i'm going to there are a bunch of questions in front of me i'm going to answer them rapid fire not really processing i think most of them are from uh, jatin thanks jatin uh, choose one of the two rodis or splits villa rules i don't know much about either but from the name i would say rodis splits villa seems like something about uh, corny broken romances so not my territory therefore rodis federer or nadal and uh, nadal federer for the beauty of it but nadal for uh, the grit nadal for the grit messi or ronaldo messi messi is other worldly Ronaldo is a better player in each of the attributes. Messi does things that I can't think of. Ronaldo is a better header of the ball than 99.9% of footballers. He's a quicker runner, more controlled. Everything other footballers do, Ronaldo is a 20% more guy, which is brilliant. Uh, but Messi is the... You know, these guys can do this. Uh, you add 20% more to them, they still can't do that other thing. That's what Messi is. Messi, is what, Messi and Federer are similar. but i like nadal as a, as, a, as a character and personality and the way he conducts himself in that element i love nadal for that federer is a very close second but between messi and ronaldo messi by a distance messi is the guy for whom we watch uh, football for one crore or 1000 excellent two i am choose <laughs> 1000 excellent crore reviews no doubt about it because if one is there if this is there that will come but as the one crore we're not going to give you the reviews the uh, the reviews will give you the money and they'll give you the satisfaction as well so double whammy i'm not saying this as a romantic which is to come a teacher i'm an academic this is what drives me i'm saying if this is there that will come and therefore i want both so i'm being greedy rather than being academic to i am or pi bob both both close to my heart i be totally letting down one over the other be a tough thing to to pick uh, pi bob has been the, the thing that i would want to build over the next decade uh, but two i am is the one that i spent the, this decade on and so i think over time we'll spend i'll be spending more and more time investing in trying to build a pipe up with a with a good team obviously 
but 2M will always be the, the, the brand that one created a commercially viable entity, which is super important. And two, like, gave us an enormous freedom to poke around and try different things with Pybub. So in many ways, 2M would have created Pybub as much as any of us would have. If Pybub sees light of day, which is a fingers crossed, it should. Lokesh, any reason for 2M courses being too costly? First of all, I don't think they're too costly. I think they're compelling value proposition. I think they offer beautiful value for that price. And the, uh, there are a couple of reasons why we, why we do this. This is beautiful meme with, uh, with Joker and Batman. I'm good at what I do, so why should I do it for free? So I think we, are, we take a lot of effort to, to put together a course. We care about pedagogy. For every question we put in the course, we bin two. For every video we shoot, we bin one. We worry about how we teach extraordinarily. So the, the, the live classes are one thing, but the product is a whole new thing. Because the live classes are with the energy, the momentum. For the product we agonize, we think about, okay, this question should come just before this. We build this idea, drop it off at that level, then go to the next thing. Here we should have a checkpoint quiz. Then we consolidate like that. So our, our teaching things, we spend a lot of time. We don't compromise on, on any of the input variables that go in there. We have the state-of-the-art hardware, state-of-the-art software, good tech team. We work, we spend money on a lot of these things. Therefore, our input costs are significantly higher than quite a few of our competitors. Two, uh, there is a certain positioning that we have had in the market where we are, we are not, we are, we believe and we have carved a positioning for ourselves in offering compelling value at the price point that we offer. We don't do run-of-the-mill stuff. The pressure that comes in running a product which you charge a premium for is something that I like. So I know that we are not giving a product at 8K. I know that there's an 8K product available in the market. I know that people will see the 8K product and they look at the 16K product that we have and say, the 16K product cannot be slightly better. It has to be compellingly better in every avenue and then some. And I think we, we work our backsides off in generating that and then some, the intangible sitting in the pedagogy, in the, the passion, in the fact that we drive home an idea such with such dogged persistence. So we spend time on that idea. So some of the ideas, I can tell you some of our students say, look, I heard this idea, it fell in place. I didn't understand it when I was in class seven. I didn't understand it when I was in class eight, class nine, but now I get it. This is why this has to be solved like that. And I don't care about cat. We, I know that every time we build content, we, we create content with the idea that we need to figure out mechanisms to take one idea and then just drill it into the into the system so such so phenomenally well that it just stays there naturally in its home settings. And that intangible that you put enormous pride for is worth its weight in gold. Very often I keep telling students that you can you, your savings are in time. I can tell you like for like, pound for pound, our course is very often cheaper. If you price your time at 300 bucks an hour, if you price your time at 200 rupees an hour and you spend 400 hours on this preparation, that is the ball game. If you can save 100 of your hours, they're dirt cheap. And, and I can bet my bottom dollar that you learn with the 2IM structure, 2IM pedagogy, 2IM course structure, the way we build it. You will learn like for like the same ideas, with the same resonance or better resonance Spending far less time, far less time. We'll teach percentages to you in four hours. And you'll know it. You'll feel like, hey, I get this. Throw me anything. I can handle this. And then we'll give you tons of practice. And whereas, the, 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 I don't want to talk about other products, but our bar, because of the price point being high, is high. And I like that pressure. Which is one of the reasons why I firmly believe that our product is good. It's because of the pressure we have taken year after year after year of justifying the premium that we, we charge which is why we have a product advantage. Right. Sanket Manna, ethical dilemma question to you. You created an app which will show the hospital bed occupancy to the citizens. It's an ongoing deadly COVID wave across the country and people are in dire need of such an app. Even though you've created the app, you were not granted regulatory approvals by the government. If you bribe the government officials, they may, oops, say, I think something has gone wrong. I seem to have lost my entire screen. Hang on. I will find this. Thankfully, it is opening the same page. I think I closed the window. Sorry about this. 
Uh, if you bribe the government official, they may expedite the approval process. If you don't, it will take another couple of months and many people may lose their lives. What will you do? I will bend over backwards, put fight. Uh, this is not an ethical dilemma as it is a legal dilemma. I don't think one is a function of my competency, one is a function of how I will go about it. I will uh, try to become the provider who then sells this app to somebody else and say, look, you do it. I don't think I have the ability to actually be in the line of fire and hand the bribe and get this going. One of my limitations, I'll have to face up to that. I won't sit here and moralize about the guys who actually do it. Sometimes this is how the setting is. I can tell you that in all honesty, I can't be the guy who strikes the deal, hands over a briefcase, make sure this happens, ticks the boxes and live in that world. So I'll find a work around it where I'm not in the line of fire. I firmly believe that it will save lives and that it has to be done. And the government machinery is dragging its feet. I'll find the best buyer for my app, sell it to them and say all the best. I won't feel bad about that buyer then using other mechanism to get it done. Such as life is the way it is. My inability to be able to do the last mile thing will prevent me from doing it. So I'll find a workaround, give it to somebody and be done with it. Is PyWub for kids only? Uh, I enjoy PyWub questions and videos. It's not for kids only. So it is uh, most definitely not for kids only. We create lots of wonderful non-routine questions. Of my, I'm a firm believer that some guys have an advantage over others, not because they do the mechanics better, but because the idea fall in one way. You look at the budget, you hear the budget speech, and the guys who know their stuff know the implication, know they under, understand all the elements. They know that this drives this, this will have this impact. For others, the rest of us is just a bunch of facts. We reach a snapshot and we, we carry on. For several people, when you read a context, the data falls in mind in one nice together gathered way. And that intuitive way is super crucial. What we're trying to do with math is to build an intuition about data processing, about problem solving, about gathering ideas and figuring out what to do with them. It's applicable for anyone. I, I would actually argue that PyBob Advanced Math course is a super toolkit to do anything. If you want to learn accounts or finance or economics, the PyBob Advanced Math course is super useful. That will be my argument. Therefore, we, it's indifferent to age segment. Why we are marketing to that age segment? Beautiful formative years. A 10 year old is the one who you can teach problem solving to bit by bit. They'll hang in with you and you can push that over 10 year horizon, 5 year horizon. Lovely segment to address. Therefore, we'll go. So, we have a uh, for PyWeb, we have a math Olympiad coming up this weekend. It's open from Friday to Sunday. So, uh, it's, it's a beautiful exam. It's a lovely exam. I would have loved to write this exam as a 10 year old, 12 year old, 13 year old. So, we, we, we are. We created a bunch of good questions. It should be lots of fun. So if you have nephews, nieces, sons, daughters, please ask them to take it. It's free. Just click sign up, register, uh, give it a go. It'll be fun. As ever with anything we do with 2IM and PyWeb, our idea is the teaching part of it, not the testing assessment part of it. So we'll go to town discussing these questions across platforms. So you will learn, to, you'll have a crack at 10 questions and know how to answer them and know the best juicy, fun, happy methods. So it, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. So anybody who's for whom it is relevant, go for that. In the same tenor, we alt for 2IM. I cannot do a pitch. Just now I've said 2IM and PyWeb are both close to the heart. We cannot do a PyWeb thing and not say what's happening in 2IM. If, uh, if there's a wonderful offer going on over this weekend. If you call for some reason, which is called the Valentine's Day discount. Or not for some reason. It is the reason. It is Valentine's Day. It's a, look, all these artificial markers of Valentine's Day, Independence Day, Chan 26, Republic Day, all of these. Sometimes it's like, look, this is a day. Why are they peddling products to me? Why is there a commercial implication for any celebration? There need not be. The other way of thinking about it is, hey, it's, it's another avenue to say, hey, I'm ambitious. I have this project. I need to dive in. It's an opportunity. Let me take this. Let me grab that. So there is an opportunity today, tomorrow, day after to say, hey, I'm, I like this. I, I've always been thinking about cat coaching. These guys are definitely know their stuff. They are expensive, but they are so cocky that say they, they deserve to be tried out. I will try it out. So please do try it out. The course is worth every rupee you spend in. You will get your money back in the time you save. We're all trading our time. No doubt about it. Don't kid yourself. All of us are trading our times. We're going to, if you price one hour of your time at anything more than 100 bucks, 
the, the two M courses are no brainer. We'll make sure that you're super ready for CAT in a wonderful, intuitive, fun manner, which is effortless for you and saves you time. So it'll, it'll pay off, it'll pay for itself rapidly. So definitely try it out. And the next two days are probably brilliant avenues to try it out because you'll get it that much cheaper. Best wishes, folks. Anish, plants in politics, education minister, <laughs> Rajesh has a nice thing to it. Yeah, I've thought about it. Not the education minister plan, politics plan. Not in the innings. Not in the innings. I am definitely public spirited, definitely civic minded. So I don't want to uh, say I'm never going that way. But I, it's not for now. I think I can, I have more clearer ambitions in what I want to do in, in, in education and in, in my professional life now in the near future. At least for now, definitely, I'm committed to this and only this. Two IM and Pi are going to be there for the foreseeable future. But at some point of time, I think the canvas offered to um, the government missionary is far more than offered to anything else. And I'm no doubt tempted by it. In fact, about a year ago, there was a lateral placement thing, which was there for uh, some, some government agencies. And there was a thing for uh, education and the digital media. I was super tempted. I almost sent in my CV and I was like, look, I like that. But I'm in the middle of something here. So I can't leave this and go. The extent to which you can influence and define the influence lives and define the scope of what this is about is huge. And I'm a pure pedagogy guy. I'm, 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 I can. I'm, I will revel in creating uh, at my at home in governing policy about how things should be taught, how school should be run, how pedagogy should be defined, how things should be taught, how YouTube should be used. I'm, we've spent years investing in, in digital media, digital format. So the, the skill set as a collective in terms of understanding, I've done uh, another graduation, post graduation. So I understand my math, physics, chemistry, English, geography, history, because I've, I've been reading for 20 years. So I intuitively understand academia, even though I've not done a PhD. And I've been in this world of teaching and training. So I'd love to have an opportunity in some government capacity. Absolutely no doubt about it. Just not now. At some point of time, if it is an executive, brilliant. If it's through the legislative, even better. The, the, the canvas is even broader. Definitely would want to do that, just not now. Kevin, what are the dark sides of investment banking? And there are tons of it, my friend. Uh, investment banking is no worse than, than, than peddling. A lot of trading is borderline insider trading. There's this famous statement saying, if you copy from one source, it is plagiarism. If you copy from six sources, it is research. If that is research and you copy from three inside information parts, it is investment banking research. A lot of trades in the market happen because of information. And there's, there's no strong form efficient market in all week form only. So uh, you, your, your CFO will tell his four colleagues that, look, I'm off on holiday because I'm not worried about the quarterly numbers. In India, they don't even respect what is called a squad period. So it's murky territory. Who makes money in the stock market is based on information flow, not research. Everybody has one 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 year towards uh, dope cover, and the, the guy who has better access at cover or better ways of mining that cover. Yeah, so it's, uh, your your Warren Buffett, the sage oracle who governs based on principles and who invests based on beautiful trajectories and investment ideas. They are one out of 15, 20, 25. The rest of them. Some, several are mediocre, they just play the game. And several are super chalu. They they keep their ears to the ground, they peddle ideas with, with, with government lobbies, they govern share prices based on tax policies, they get this cut, that cut, so it's, it's just murky territory. There are several dark sides to it. Spiritual Rasoi. Namaskar Guruji, do you do meditation? No, much against, much to the angst of some people who have... Um, very clearly recommended it to me, people who I trust and respect. I've not yet taken that up. I think my next battle is with fitness after that meditation. Too young for meditating. Who's the greatest poet on the planet? I'm not much into poetry, Alan, so I will not be able to answer anything there. Ritik Raj, most important thing to crack interview. Um, good, especially if it's a HR interview, good ability to understand what you are about. Beautiful uh, research on what they expect. What is expected out of you? Very often, 
when you go to showcase in an interview, and I've done this mistake several times, I'm painfully aware of what I'm about and have a limited ability to rephrase in terms of what the recruiter wants. So you should, we, we all want to showcase what we are about. We don't want to think in terms of what the requirement is. So I've had several candidates who said, look, uh, I want to do an MBA. I want to do, uh, learn how to teach. And I think your organization will be a good fit for me. I look at the CV and I'll delete it. I'll maybe send a snarky comment to Bharat and say, this guy doesn't even know how to pitch himself. Why would we recruit him? And I've had guys who come to our office and said, sir, uh, give me a week. I'll work at zero. Don't you pay me anything. Give me one week. Give me any job in your place. I'll work here. If it works for you, maybe you can give me a job. He said, look, that's your desk. Go sit. In a week, he had a job. So define yourself in terms of the requirement for the organization, not in, merely in terms of what you bring to the table. It's super important. Why do top IMs uh, charge so much for a two or one year MBA program? What? Cost equations are like that. They need to have a big campus. They need to have a relationship with several uh, different agencies. Uh, they need to accommodate the ability to have big academic pools. Teachers, they need to pay them well. The teacher-student ratio in, in good colleges is 10 is to 1, 12 is to 1. They have academics who are there. They don't have other source of revenue than this. They have a giant campus which has to support this ecosystem. So their costs are pretty high. Several of these colleges are not fiercely profitable. That's one. Two, there's a there's a there's a demand at that price point. They are, they have a supply to, to clear. Who are we to deny that? Shristi Sharma, I'm in the final year of PB honors. I will graduate by May. I've got a pre-placement offer from SP Global starting from June as a CAT repeater who's aiming for CAT 2022. What should be my preparation plan as I'll start working from, oh, prepare now, start now, no doubt about it. Do the basics now. Uh, if you're comfortable with the basics, start taking mocks as early as possible. Utilize the gap between your break and work starting really well. Use your final year really well. Your final semester in college is the best fun time, nothing to do. Use that window really well to, to prepare for gap. I just want to have one look at how we're doing on time and we're doing really badly on time. <laughs> uh, we've had a, I think we've had too long a session. I, I didn't see that time going by and being really unfair to the system. I don't know if enough of you are hanging around for this to be meaningful. I've just been looking at a camera and having a chat. So maybe at some point of time in the next five, 10 minutes, we'll, we'll point out. There is, there is only so much uh, random chatter we can take in a day. If it, if it is really fine, maybe we can do it one more a little while later uh, across maybe a separate set of topics. Uh, thoughts of UPSC? No, never did. I did not take it seriously. The, the exam requirements and the context don't suit my strengths. I'm a very heavy duty application guy than a knowledge based guy. So I would have really struggled with the UPSC setting, which is probably one of the reasons why I didn't take to it. I, I respect the job. Is it okay career wise to start working at a startup in a non tech role? This is Vasuprada. Oh, most definitely. You learn tons of stuff in interesting startups, especially ones that are transparent and based on sound business principles. and sound ethical principles as well, you we'll learn a lot. Uh, and that is worth something, definitely worthwhile. Abhishek Kumar Singh, can India develop, become a developed nation? I doubt it. The gap is huge. The track record of companies transitioning from uh, developing to developed is, is minimal. Singapore managed it, probably South Korea managed it. There's practically no other example of that happening. I'm not overly hopeful of it happening in my lifetime. Having said that, being a developing country, being an upright, good one, treating its citizens well, helping them live fulfilling, happy lives, very much possible. That's what we should aspire to. Anandu, how do you avoid burnout during preparation? Define preparation as a separate thing, not completely contingent on the result. Enjoy the idea of learning math, learning English, learning puzzle solving. Don't define it in terms of, okay, I need to get to this college pronto. Hmm. Ravi Chauhan, why South Indian teachers are so polite and down to earth? I don't think, I, I sometimes think some of the North Indian teachers are phenomenal. Their, their ability to reach out to an audience is uh, sometimes better than South Indian teachers. South Indian, North Indian teachers, 
bond with their uh, students better they, they connect with them more um, more personally perhaps. i think that the respect culture in north india is also very good there's always a sir the people they, they fall at the feet and the guru is special in, in north india which, which just sometimes i think they i don't i'm not used to being uh, given so much respect by some north indian students so i, I get like slightly I'm like, okay, why is this happening? I get unnerved by it. But I like that subculture. It is nice. So, so I don't think there is any difference in terms of how passionate North Indian teachers are, how, how compellingly good they are, and how down to earth they are. They sometimes define the scope of their role broader than South Indians. South Indians are sometimes this passionate. They think, like, I'm going to teach this. I'm not moralizing. I'm not going to say how you lead your life or govern your other decisions. I'm teaching this and I'm heading out. Whereas North Indians have more of a stake. Teachers have more of a state. Generally, I'm obviously stereotyping. And this is all, but I, I don't think South Indians are per se more polite or down to earth than Indians. Why don't you start Twitter spaces? I don't even know. I don't understand that world well. Maybe Bharat will soon. I'm going to wind up here, more or less. Maybe one or two. Un Anshuman, an Arsenal fan here. My question, which football team do you support and why and when did you start supporting them? Support Barcelona. I really fell in love with uh, Spanish football because I, I started following football in 96, 97. And 98 World Cup was a big deal for me. I watched 94 World Cup, uh, which I think had uh, Romario, Bebeto and a good Italian team. The 98 World Cup is the one that I understood really, but I was a big Brazil fan by then. So I had a uh, fan of Ronaldo and then Zidane ruled that World Cup. And then I, after that, I, I suddenly saw European football. And I was like, look, I'm getting a hit once in four years from world football. And then there are Euros and European football, which is lively and at a high level. And I fell in love with Spanish football because it was filled with Brazilian, Argentinian players. Back then, the, the big two teams, always the big two teams, I mean, Madrid and Barcelona. I, I really liked the Madrid team because it, it had a... I didn't get the Barcelona team. Madrid was the dominant team then. I didn't know the subculture, the, the, the Catalan story, their philosophies, their beliefs, what they were about. The incumbent dominant team was Madrid. It had Roberto Carlos and Wings, it had Miguel Salgado, it had Fernando Hierro. Then they got Figo, then they got Ronaldo, then they got Zidane. And they had a, they had a guy called Santiago Solari, they had Raul and Morientes. It was a vibrant, beautiful team. Um, uh, so I, I was a big Real Madrid fan, not even a Barcelona fan. Back then I didn't understand. Uh, I still remember a conversation with a senior. He said, Look, which fan are you? I said Real Madrid and Barcelona. It's like, look, dude, you can't like both. <laughs> I didn't know that you couldn't, it's, you can't like both. But I didn't know how fierce the rivalry was, the history or the cultural context, none of that. And then, Raikard and Ronaldinho happened. And Beckham went to Madrid, and Ronaldinho went to Barcelona. That was, that, was a, that, was a, that was like a switch flipped on for me. I was a gigantic fan of the brand of football Ronaldinho was about. And I, I, I didn't get Beckham. Beckham was a compellingly good footballer. Not just a sporting personality, but a compellingly good footballer. But Beckham was all hustle and, and perseverance. And, and Ronaldinho was all triangles and cute touches and genius. So I fell in with that, love with that Ronaldinho, Raikard team. And ever since then, I've been a Barcelona fan. I, my Barcelona fandom predates even Messi. So I was a big fan of Andrea Siniesta before uh, even Messi. There you go. Akshat Gupta, what skills should I look to pick up uh, during MBA at IIT Madras? Learn, you do your academics really well. Have your uh, ears to the ground. Uh, whichever stream you're going to, uh, being multi-skilled is super important. You need to understand how to pitch an idea, how to edit a video, how to understand Excel sheets. Those skills that you should, you should, you should, you should pick up. Do well academically, unwittingly you will end up picking up. It has been a long evening. I'm really sorry I kept not carried away. So I keep has been hanging in there for a long time in our office, going late into the night. I'm, I'm, I hope I haven't bored all of you, or bored too many of you. I had good fun. We've been meaning to, we've been saying we'll, be, we'll do something like this for a while. We've been kept on deferring it for uh, more meaningful, relevant uh, cat stuff. This is fun. We should shoot the breeze every now and then, not, not worry about it. We can do this in February. Probably can't do this in August, where we are in the midst of um, mocks and mock taking session and all of that. So it's good fun chatting with all of you. Many, many thanks for um, uh, 
handing in your questions and hanging in the chat window and having and just being there with us through this the whole session. Uh, please do check out the, uh, the, the, the two IM course, patronize that, become a trial user, go through that. It's compellingly good. We have a wonderful discount running over the weekend. Please do check that out. Check the course out. It will, uh, I'm sure that you will be able to appreciate the course in some form. And then you take the decision on whether you want to buy or not later on. Definitely take time out to try out the course. I'm sure you will you will veer towards buying it. Like our channel, subscribe to the channel. We are we are we do fantastic stuff on YouTube and we, we really enjoy doing that. So please hit like on this video, subscribe to the channel, click on that bell icon, do the, the whole bells and whistles. Uh, we love doing YouTube sessions and, and a big part of that is because we love the, the feedback and love and affection we have from from, from our our community on, on YouTube. Please continue to patronize us. And, and hang in with us on YouTube. We will do wonderful work in CAD preparation. We will make sure that we have a beautiful course which stands the test of time. We already have it and we will continuously tweak it and improve it. Thank you. Best wishes for all of you. Many thanks for hanging around with us for this long and apologies for rattling on for this long. Cheers.